Hello and welcome to Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, but this is a special edition. It's called Flat Earth and the Future, so it's not so much about Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes, although it's being hosted on my channel. I'm Patricia Steer, and we have a, a lineup of some Flat Earthers here to talk with you and get your questions in chat about Flat Earth and the future, where it's going, and sometimes where it is right now. So that's what we've got going today, and uh, let's welcome in the panel. First up, we've got Matrix Decode. Ben, how you doing? Hey, Patricia. I'm doing good, thank you. Looking forward to the show. Thank you for being here. David Weiss is up next. Hello, David. I'm doing great, Patricia. Nice to see you and right. everybody else. Jesse Spots checks in next. Hey, Jesse. Checking in. Check, check. How are you? <laughs> great, thanks. Mark K. Sargent is here. Hello, Mark. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. And wrapping it all up, the panel that is, is uh, Rob Skiba. Rob, hello. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, well, what we're going to do is try to discuss what's going on in Flat Earth. And there's been a lot of things happening lately that have caused uh, some, some disturbances in the Flat Earth. And my opinion about the Flat Earth in general is I welcome all those who want to debate the Flat Earth, attempt to, to disprove the Flat Earth, any sorts of experiments that come up that will challenge our belief system, I welcome that. So uh, in our chat today, we may have some people asking some questions about those sorts of things, and I welcome that. Um, so let's see, how do we want to start this all off? There's a, there's a Guardian article, and I know that uh, David, Mark, we've been discussing that, uh, that came out today that brought Flat Earth into mainstream consciousness yet again. And this time it's not a, it's not a bad mention. Mark, you want to handle that? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just bring, bring it up briefly because uh, it was sent to me pretty quick by a, um, a listener, you know, because the internet high mind misses nothing. And the Guardian ran a story which was, I mean, they were straight to the point which talked about flat earthers are back, but then they went right into uh, Tiger Dan's reversal of his flat earth views and said that he turned on his 26,000 subscribers and went to, in, basically went into a lot of the flat earth drama and then brought up uh, that I was pro and, and brought up my website and then brought up Eric and a little backstory uh, about Eric Dubay. Uh, didn't really go into the debunking side of it, didn't mention, you know, people, didn't call people out and say, oh, it was crazy or anything like that, but it was interesting. And, again, the fact that they brought up Tiger Dan right away, you know, they're, they're feeding off the drama and, and everything that goes with it. So that's how I was introduced to it this morning. Would anybody else like to address the Guardian uh, article that came out earlier this morning? I thought it was very positive. It... it, it pushed Flat Earth Clues. You know, once you watch Flat Earth Clues, it's kind of like trying heroin, I think. It's hard to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse. Sorry for the reference. No, and I liked it too. I mean, I, I had my initial reaction, which was what was right at the, like, the first paragraph, was like, ugh, in the video. But then you actually get a cohesive narrative about what's going on in the Flat Earth. So it's like it was unique for that fact. I think they tried to paint us as a religion, a cult, but otherwise uh, a person could read that article, it's very high profile, and jump right in and know the context, know the history. So that's, I mean, you can't do much better than that. Yeah, and it didn't mention Tila Tequila, which was uh, was pleasant yeah. for me. Yeah, and, <laughs> and all, the, all the links were active. You know, it, there was a link to uh, Tiger Dan's video. There was a link to, to EnclosedWorld.com. Uh, they even went so far, and, and I, that's why I released that uh, Monty Python skit today. They even went so far as to link the, the original video to uh, the life of Brian, where Brian loses his shoe, and it was kind of a, a take on organized religion. But it was amazing. It was a pretty in-depth article. A lot of people have been talking about it as being positive, some saying neutral. The only thing I thought, well, a lot of things I thought, but one thing I'll bring up now is the part where it says Tiger Dan, quote, turned on his followers. I know a lot of his followers are Christians, so uh, we don't know if he's, quote, unquote, turned on them yet. So that was a bit of a misstep by the person who wrote the article. So um, Tiger Dan, many will say, has turned on Flat Earth. But you know what? In Flat Earth, we're all able like we are outside of Flat Earth, to change our mind, do new research, come up with new thoughts and ideas. So I'm not saying that what Tiger Dan has, is doing is good. I'm just saying that that's what we need to be doing is testing 
Well, Rob Skiva's got testing the globe, testing our own belief systems by, you know, doing experiments, watching other people's experiments, and questioning our own selves as to our belief systems all of the time. It's really the only way we should uh, be involved in Flat Earth. And I, David, I know you and I were discussing that earlier about Flat Earth, uh, that it's not like I want it to be true. I don't want all these things that we talk about to be true, David. It, it it's just you have to question it. You know that's what I started out trying to debunk the flat Earth, and re really, um, I'm still looking for something to debunk. You know, I'll find a piece of evidence and go, you know what, that doesn't prove the flat Earth, but it doesn't prove the globe either. I haven't found anything definitive that proves the globe, so that's pretty clear that that's not going to change. You know what I would like to see Tiger do if he's really against the flat Earth, come out with. Uh, debunking his 25 proofs that the Earth is flat. I mean, that that was an amazing series. The, address each one of those and debunk them. And also, Max Egan came out with a, a video today talking about plane routes. Has anybody seen that video, and does anybody have a comment on it? I know, David, you've seen it. Mark, have you seen it? I'm sorry, which one? Max Egan came no, out. No, no, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, uh -huh. I know, David, you have. I'll chime in. Max uh, took a flight from uh, sh from South America to uh, Australia, and he was on that Qantas flight number 27. He filmed himself in the airport. He showed the board. He showed the announcements, the boarding. He showed himself on the airplane. He showed himself arriving at the other destination. Um, he even claimed that you know everything proved that the flight is there. The only thing that we have to take his word on is how many hours it took to get there, and I don't see any reason that he would be lying. However, it's always nice to prove these things. So he, uh, he said that he reached out to a couple flat earthers to run a Google Hangout for the entire time of the flight, that he would join it at both ends, and that would prove it. Um, I thought that was a great idea. I even offered in comments to uh, when he does his return flight or the next time he does it to host that for him. Um, so, probably, you know, what does this prove? You know, if he did it in, I think he said 13 and a half hours, what does it prove? Does it prove that the map is uh, maybe slightly off, maybe? Does it prove that um, maybe the planes are traveling at different speeds? You know, the, the, the biggest comment by, you know, ballers and flat earthers is it can't go faster than the speed of sound it would disintegrate well you know what I don't know if that's true I mean that might have been true years ago but with different composite metals and aircraft and engines who knows maybe we can go faster than sound I mean it doesn't sound unreasonable to me looking for proof either way so if you can take this plane flight and I'm going to trust Ma Max Egan he's a good, good truth seeker although he's not a flat earther um, if you can take this flight, and it's not a fake flight like many flat earthers have claimed, I've not claimed that, I wouldn't know, I don't know, um, then that doesn't disprove flat earth, it doesn't prove ball earth, it just proves that there is a flight. Maps, I think, are an issue. The maps that we currently have are incorrect, and Jesse, I see you raising your hand. Well, yeah, I, I just never understood the premise to begin with that a single flight, I mean, you can get on YouTube and look for these Qantas flights, I mean, it doesn't have the full journey. But the question has always been um, further away from the center of the, what is it, the azimuthal map, right? And Mr. Thrive and Survive made this wonderful video about cartography and how in that particular map, the further you get away from the center, the less accurate it gets. So I just don't understand how anybody can say, you know, uh, there's absolutely no continental distortion going on. This, this flight is here. This flight isn't there. I just don't, I don't even understand the premise. You know, frankly, it's like I've never put that much faith in the azimuthal map that all of those things were accurate. You know what I mean? Rob, do you have something to add to that? I thought I saw you motioning, or yeah, maybe I should um, put my glasses on. <laughs> no, well, um, you're kind of circling back around to the Tiger Dan issue. Um, you know, as many of you guys probably know, I, I went all out for like six months. I'm like, Whoa! You know, I, I, I heard Mark Sargent on Canary Cry, I think it was April 13th, and I had him on my radio show, I think it was the 15th, and from April 15th to October 15th, I ate, drank, slept, every, I mean, from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep, it was flat earth aside from, you know, dealing with some health issues and things that kind of caused some interruptions, but I said, I'm going to give myself six months, I'm going to look into this, and, and boy, I mean, it was a very, very deep rabbit hole, but uh, when I 
step back from all that, and, and I think I was on, Patricia, I think it was on your show not too long before I st really stopped looking into it, and I believe it was on your show that I coined the phrase that I am a zetetic agnostic. Um, I'm probably the only guy on this panel right now that's not saying, I'm a flat earther. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a zetetic agnostic in the sense that I am proceeding with inquiry, that's what zetetic means, and agnostic is somebody who doesn't believe they can prove it either way. So somebody asked me on a scale of 1 to 10, what are you? Uh, you know, if one is a you know 100%, we believe in a spherical Earth, and 10 is 100% flat Earth. I'm probably a seven, you know, if I was to be honest with myself. Um, but when I took a step back, I, I'm still watching your videos. I'm watching Mark's stuff. Anytime he's got somebody on, great uh, show you just did, Mark. By the way, with the uh, Air Force guy, that was really cool. Uh, and you know, I'm I'm listening to your interviews, Patricia, and I'm I'm listening to Tiger Dan. I'm watching his stuff, and when I saw Tiger Dan. Uh, attempting to put together the first real flat earth map, I got real excited because I think everybody acknowledges that the AE map is basically just a ball that was squished into a you know circle. Uh, it, it's based on the ball. So there, I don't believe we have a map that's 100% accurate based solely on the flat earth. So when he started the project, I got real excited about it. But uh, this I don't want to speak for him because I don't know. I'm just going to give my opinion as an outsider looking in. What appeared to happen is he got really obsessive, uh, got real excited, probably spent 15 to 20 hours a day working on it, and then he ran into uh, the bird wall. <laughs> uh, he, he, when you run into the Antarctic problem and the flights in the southern hemisphere and stuff like that, I mean, this is something I ran into probably within three weeks of starting the research, you know, probably within the first week even. Um, I, for him to say that the, I mean, he started calling all the flat earthers liars and stuff like that, and that we, we none of us, uh, that we say that uh, Antarctica doesn't exist and things like that, I'm like, I don't know any flat earther who ever said that. We all look at it and say, well, it's the outer rim, you know. Uh, nobody's denied that Antarctica is there, but basically I think he just did a pendulum swing. He, he hit this wall and he freaked out. Um, and you know he has he shares the same biblical worldview that I do, and I've just put out a series of videos in the last couple of days, showing in no uncertain terms uh, again that the Bible is a flat Earth book from Genesis to Revelation. You cannot get around it. It's the worldview that almost every ancient culture had. So in that sense, is for people like me who grew up with the Bible and who claim it as our source for truth, and we say we believe it uh, can be taken literally. We almost need the flat Earth to be true, because the alternative is if if the, we really are in a spinning heliocentric ball or even just a stationary geocentric ball, what do we do with our Bible? And so, for some of us, it becomes very stressful. <laughs> and I, I'll just be transparent. Uh, I have spent a fair number of evenings crying myself to sleep, going, "God, what does this mean? What what is the truth?" You know, uh, so in fairness to Tiger Dan, I, I think he just had a meltdown because he, he got real passionate, spent a lot of time, and it hit a roadblock. Um, I think he needs to take a step back. It has been very healthy for me uh, since I stopped stepped back. I stopped looking into this back in October. Um, but stuff started coming to me. I, instead of me digging and looking and searching and researching, that stuff was just falling in my lap. And, uh, you know, it's good for all of us to take a break. So I just want to say, hey, Tiger Dan, I forgive you. He put out a hit piece on me <laughs> a couple days ago. Um, it really backfired on him, unfortunately, because he distorted what I said. But I think we need to be a little bit forgiving and say, hey, look, he's put out some great work. It doesn't mean he's a shill. It doesn't mean somebody's got a gun to his head and he's been bought off or you know that he's uh, Illuminati or whatever. I just think he had a meltdown, and uh, we need to show him some grace. And, and I would say to him, dude, take a break. <laughs> take a breather come back and revisit in a couple months probably. All right. Thank you, Rob. Does anybody else want to add something to that uh, conversation? No, Mark? No? You, um, well, I, no, no, I no, I will. I will. I will. Oh, okay, good. Sorry, sorry. Um, well, okay, I, again, and, and I agree with everything you said there, Rob. I, for me, honestly, though, uh, and, and I was watching Jesse's video, you know, when he was kind of calling him out, as it was looking very suspicious. Look, it, I, I, I'll draw the line between the two, and that is, I agree as long as he doesn't keep going down the path that he's going. I mean, if he actually finishes that 10-part series going against the Flat Earth, then I, then I have huge doubts because he made 34 videos in a row over five months 
talking about how everything in the fly roof was right. And then, yeah, like you were saying, he he's you could see it when you were, you were following the same thing that I was, where he's like working, he's doing daily progress on the maps, and he's and he's trying to work it. You knew he was getting into a he was, he was painting himself into a corner, and then all of a sudden. Instead of this gradual thing like I have doubts, I uh, you know I've got bad feelings about this. I don't know if it's right. He went from I'm working on the map. I'm working on the map. I hate everyone and every, <laughs> everyone's against me. And I'm going to attack the entire movement simultaneously. It's like I'm just staring. I'm going. I, he seemed like the kindest, most gentlest person out there. It just killed me. So which is why I've never addressed it. You know, and uh, really until now, I, and not in text. I, I I don't know what to say. I, but yeah, you know, I'm hope I'm I'm sorry, Jesse. So anyway, so yeah, I hope he comes back, but I don't know. You Jesse, don't get. Or, uh, okay, go ahead, Jesse. I'm sorry. Who? Uh, Jesse, did you make a motion that you wanted to say something? Yeah, I I realized I was cutting off David though. Can you hear me? Because my uh sound toggled. Perfect. Um, I I f I forgive Tiger Dan in in the the Christian meaning of the word, and and I um. You know, there's so much to it because so many people stored their faith in him, including you, Rob. And so many of us are now fielding people who, I mean, a lot of these people are hardcore YouTube users. They've been trolled before. They know what it's like to be betrayed. But yet this one of somebody they identified with so much, making such a 180, it's like we're, we're doing grief counseling now, like telling people like where this guy is coming from and making excuses for him. And, and Mark is right. That number 10 is just something he's holding over us so that he doesn't have to actually respond to Jaron. He doesn't have to respond to me. He doesn't have to respond to anybody. So I'm watching the situation. I'm forgiving him actively all the time. But at the same time, it's like, what about everybody? What about all these people? I mean, 2,000 subscribers that have jumped ship, at, you know, I'm sure there are many heartbroken people who need our sympathy more than Tiger Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'd like to jump in. You know, I, I was, uh, I, when I was on your show, Rob, I told everybody I used to be an atheist my whole life, and then Flat Earth has uh, made me realize there's something far greater. So, you know, being the former atheist and I... Um, I wouldn't say I'm religious. This might come off sounding a little religious, especially to people that are not. But um, I think it's something more than just a meltdown. You know, somebody can't do such good work, showing such good proofs, and then all of a sudden say, "Oh my God!" You know, I, 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 I'm freaking out, and then come out with his arguments are so poor. You know, the the number four. I was going to call it Clue 4, but you know, uh, Episode 4, he's like, flat earthers say railroad tracks you know, prove the flat earth. No, railroad tracks are used to show perspective and the vanishing point. I don't think anyone's ever said that. And his arguments seem so weak. You know, is he being forced? I don't want to say that. That's very conspiratorial. Is he spiritually attacked? You know, maybe, you know, somehow he let some other spirit into him um, that is affecting him. Because I don't know Tiger Dan. I've seen his videos. I've seen his interview with Patricia. I am a pretty good judge of character, people's uh, way they speak, the way they present themselves, their intellect. This is not Tiger Dan speaking. This is uh, something else has gotten into him. And um, and I will say for the first time ever publicly, I'm praying for the guy. I actually re uh, reached out to him when this first happened, when he came out with his first video, in which I think that's the one where he called Jaron and other flat earthers a liar, and I messaged him just because we had some nice conversations uh, when he was a, an interview subject on my show and a little back and forth via messaging and I messaged him and he didn't respond I just said hey maybe you're going through a lot this is before all these other things had come out maybe you're going through a lot take a take a break take a relax a little bit and you know we're here for you I don't mean we as the flat earth community I just meant we speaking as of myself as we just to be nice you know because I figured he was getting hammered but then of course he didn't respond. And then he did finally respond. He just wrote, yes, Pat, I'm doing fine. But that's all he said. And before I got the group together to do this roundtable, and by the way, thanks to all for doing it. I know it was tough finding the right time for everybody to meet. But I did invite him to come back on my show at some time and talk with me, and he hasn't responded yet to that. So it is not as if I, myself, and I can't speak for everyone here, but I think you're all the same, have said, I don't ever want to talk to the guy. He's evil. He's horrible. Door is shut. Flat Earth is not a cult. You can come and go as you please. You can change your mind as you please. You can come up with new 
better information and present it to us because speaking for myself I want other information to show me what the world is that I'm living in I welcome it I won't be ashamed if I prove that we live on a ball I'll just say thank you I was wrong and you know move on with my life still do videos on on new things that I've discovered if I feel like continuing to do videos um, I I just want uh, to know if everybody else feels the same way. Do Does everyone agree with this kind of a statement or not? Feel free to disagree if you wish. Anybody want to chime in? Uh, Rob? Well, you know, to actually to uh, David's point, um, I, I do think there's a spiritual issue here. Um, I have dealt with no shortage of controversial topics in my life. Anybody who's followed my work knows that I, I deal with controversial issues. But I have never in my life experienced the kind of blowback and just um, vitriol that I've experienced just by looking into this subject. So I can imagine that he's probably got a lot of that going on as well. But I do applaud him in his desire to um, sort of raise the bar of accountability in our integrity and how we present stuff without confirmation bias. Um, so on that side of what he's doing, I agree with him. I think you know we had the initial wow factor of last year, but now that we've kind of reached a certain certain equilibrium in all of this, it's time to take a step back, evaluate our own material. Are we having confirmation bias that's it, that's influencing us? Are we skewing the results to prove a point? Um, you know, so I, I see him on one hand doing that, but I also see him having knee jerk. Uh, reactions and vitriol and stuff like that, which may be the result of uh, you know the spiritual issue going on here. But yeah, I agree with what you just said, uh, Patricia. Hey, you know, let's we are all tr if hopefully all of us are just on a quest for truth, and let the let the truth be what the truth is, and let's not be fighting each other. Anybody else want to add to this yeah. aspect? Yes, I do. Good, um, I'm glad. I'm glad that I didn't let you left out. <laughs> Well, I think the Tiger Dan uh, issue that's been happening recently, I, I think it's strange, the, very strange, the way he's been trying to debunk Flat Earth. I mean, I think the evidence that he's provided is, is very, very weak, and he's attacked arguments that no one really uses, and uh, he's been very vague about many things, and he just seems to be trying to, desperate to discredit Flat Earth. And, um, you know, I can understand that, you know, people are going to be flip-flopping, having doubts, and it's, it's like bound to happen. But you know the, the the evidence for flat Earth is so compelling, and you know, and it is this internal struggle that people are going to have, um, deciding you know leaving you know having to go through and research so much so many things to uh, of the ball Earth science that we've been taught all of our lives and break down the indoctrination. So it's it's going to be a tough a tough journey, and it takes a lot of time and, and effort and and research to come to a point where you're saying well. This the flat Earth evidence outweighs the ball Earth evidence, and so there's going to be this con continual struggle. Even when you come to the point where you say, "Okay, I'm a flat Earther," because that's what, what's what, where the evidence points to, you still have these like lingering doubts. You know, people around you, and, and you have to keep reminding yourself of the of what you believe in, the proofs, the various different proofs. Um, so I mean, I, I'm not sure what's happening with Tiger Dan. I mean, it's it's very very strange, and um, yeah, I mean. Uh, I think there is a spiritual aspect to all of this, and if Tiger Dan is a Christian, then the way he's behaving, accusing people of being, you know, the way he has, um, I think it's quite quite strange. Um, yeah. But, I mean, we, we still have many things to figure out in the flat earth. You know, this, I mean, we've got various proofs. We can do so much, but there's so much still to discover, and I think that's, that's where we're going. I think more and more people are coming to flat earth, and they will bring their own talents and ideas and concepts and be able to break, bring new stuff to the table. And that's what's exciting about it. Is, you know, something new keeps coming up, whether it's the star, looking at the stars in the sky, or you know, more experiments being done, being refined, information being refined. Uh, one, one of the things you said about the you know, flat Earth not being a cult, that's something I'd like to touch on later, perhaps, uh, or, or, or now. You know, I, I don't think flat Earth is a cult. I think flat Earth is full of many different people with different philosophies, many individuals, and, and it's a it's a it's a movement. I think this is happening. I, I think to label it as a cult is is unfair. 
Um, I don't think that anyone's a, a, a solid devotee, a, a follower. I think you know everyone's got their own ideas and takes on things and different perspectives, different models, different you know. So um, I don't think it's a cult at all. I think anyone who tries to label that is is doing it, it, it a disservice. I agree completely with what you just said, Matrix, and thank you very much. Yes, the cult label is being thrown around a little bit post this Tiger Down event uh, that uh, he's got out of the cult. But if he were providing real solid evidence as opposed to the flimsy things that he's relying on, then uh, if we said we don't want to hear these things, we still believe the earth is flat, then we would be acting like a cult. But he's not yet provided any real solid evidence. I've never one time suggested railroad tracks proved flat earth. And the one previous to that, I can't even remember what it was in the video, if anybody can recall. Uh, Rob, do you remember? Anybody remember? I've lost track as to what it was. Oh, Jesse, what was it? Do you remember? I don't remember. I was, okay. I was just going to say... I was just going to say, Jaren's response video, Mr. Thrive and Survive's video, I, I think that really showed the strength of the community because here we are looking for a weakness and all of a sudden I'm saturated in new evidence. And this this was maybe, you know, I haven't revisited Antarctica in a long time and suddenly I'm strengthening my faith that Antarctica is fraudulent from all this stuff that Jaren brings up and Mr. Thrive and Survive's. So I actually think it ended up kind of strengthening people from the inside and just those particular elements, and I just wanted to throw that in there before we, you know, moved on. I'm glad you, know, you did, because that's what it was. It was Antarctica. He was saying that flat earthers don't believe Antarctica exists, and, that, which, which and, of course, I've never met anybody who thought that. David? Any publicity, as Mark always says, is good publicity. Well, Tiger Dan inspired um, some of us to do our best work. I made a pretty decent video. Jaron made a fantastic video um, showing what's going on in, our, in Antarctica. And, um, you know, I think all of this contrast uh, inspires new desires in us, and it makes us better. So, you know, if, if that's the path he's taken that you know will we'll let him take his path but it's gonna push us down another path even farther so I have, I have great hopes and expectations for where um, flat earth awareness is going Mark what do you have to add to this oh just real quick I, I know that Rob had something but uh, yeah and and inadvertently Tiger Dan created uh, more media to where you know beforehand for the what the last week 10 days it's been it's been nothing but that Tila tequila story when you been when you type in flat Earth and and go on news and all of a sudden blink, here you go on top and uh, now the flat Earth movement as a whole is now in the spotlight again. So we'll see where that goes. Rob, did you want to add something earlier? Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, you know minus the ad hominem attacks and and baseless accusations and things like that, disagreement can and controversy can be really good for all of us. Uh, in fact, I would just say by way of example that my second book, uh, Archon Invasion, most of that book came as a result of disagreements uh, on Facebook. <laughs> uh, I have a certain view concerning the topic of the Nephilim, and there are other colleagues that share the same passion and research, and we disagree on certain conclusions. And we would have knockout, drag out, you know, knockdown, drag out fights on Facebook and <laughs> debates that would be marathon, you know, thousand post response, you know. Um, but what, what I think is good about that is that debate can help us to strengthen our own position, uh, like has already been said. The, the, the video that Jaronism put out was outstanding. I was like, dude, fantastic, you know. Uh, so in a way, this can be good as long as we don't go at each other's throats. Like the people that I debated with that book, we're still friends. You know, we're not coming at each other's throats. We just passionately disagreed on a subject. But that required, you know, in order for me to defend against their points, I had to go deeper into what I thought I believed. And it resulted in my book. So, you know, I think this is good for the overall community as long as we don't get at each other's throats and we can still, you know, be friends afterwards. Very well stated, well stated. If anyone watching and or listening is curious about how this panel was put together, it kind of just happened spontaneously. I had a bad sinus headache the past couple of days and missed out on my usual secret show with Mark Sargent this past Monday. And um, because of that, I, I didn't do a show. And then I started chatting with some of the members of this panel, not on a Hangout or anything, just via Skype. And I thought, well, you know what? Let's talk about the things we're talking about off camera. 
on camera. And there were a few other people I contacted that couldn't make it, but did want to. The Morgyle, Jaron, they're actually doing Globusters as we speak, so the timing wasn't good. But this timing was necessary to get the people that are here here. So, um, also Ashley Webster, I wanted to involve her as well because of the experiment aspect of this. So we're missing out on that component. And I'm hoping that if this is successful and everyone's happy with this, especially those who are viewing, and we'll see that in the comments later when this goes to YouTube, I would like to do something like this again, perhaps with some of the same panelists, depending on your schedule, and additional panelists, and even people I didn't in initially invite. I actually asked Math Powerland as well. Um, he's doing some cross-country drive right now to Sedonia and was not against being on it. He just couldn't. So I am not hand-picking certain people and leaving out other people. It's just that there's only so many that can be in a hangout without the thing being pulled down, crashing through bandwidth, and it was just who was able to say yes right away and who was already talking to me about the subject. So I just wanted to let everybody know about that. All right, anything more on the Tiger Dan issue that anybody would like to bring up before we kind of close that off and then move on to a different aspect of uh, the future of Flat Earth? Uh, what do you have, Rob? Well, I just, not necessarily just directly re related to the Tiger Dan issue, but overall, we have all had the yeah but guys contacting us. You know, we put some video out, we put some kind of discovery out, or, or whatever our research is leading us to. And there's always the yeah but guy. Well, what about this? What about this? Yada yada yada. I would like to suggest that I mean, what what Jaronism, what Jaron did, was awesome. Here here was a yeah but issue, and he went to town on it. Boom! Wow, dude, amazing. I would like to see the community come together with all of the various yabbits that we have been encountering and you know I don't care whose websites it's on or maybe we can all share the information on a Google Doc or something like that but I mean th I think this would be really helpful is if we had a topic related you know column you know, table that says, okay, here's the issue. What's the best video evidence uh, you know, research out there that can answer that? Because I don't know about the other guys here, but, you know, I get sick of repeating myself. My answer now to most people when they come in, like the newbies, with all the questions we all had a year ago is, look, I'm not going to do your homework. There's a reason I put 52 videos on YouTube and wrote 500 pages on my website. Go do your own homework. Um, but if we can have, like, a a place where all of us can go and input our data for very specific yeah but questions and problems I think that would be very beneficial to the whole uh, movement. Makes a lot of sense. I got an email earlier from Chris Truthseeker. He says it's a question for the panel this evening to all involved. Um, he will be otherwise engaged when it is live currently. And he writes, would it be beneficial to centralize and or unite all the flat earth slash non-spinning ball video makers shows and information so that it can reach more people and also so that any newcomers to the flat earth topic can easily find all the most popular content and best information slash evidence. This would strictly be the in the interest of the information and evidence that at the very least dispels the current spinning ball slash globe lie and myth. That's from yeah. Chris Truthseeker. It's a good idea, but how to do it and where to do it. Anybody well, have that's basically what I was. That, that's basically what I was just saying. You know, it, it's it's for that person. You know, and if you know, we if we can share the information. So in other words, it's not you know my my resource. It's not Mark's or anybody else's. You know, th that we have this shared resource that we can all kind of kind of contribute to. Uh, that that would help exactly what this person is addressing. Jesse, I saw you making some kind of motions. Did you want to speak? I think, well, I mean, basically like a wiki, I think, right, Rob? Something like that. Yeah. Like, I, lo I love that. Yeah. Um, shared resource. But as far as centralization otherwise, people kind of suggest that all the time of, like, just get all the people together. And I personally am a big fan of decentralization. I, I think that as far as a movement, especially something where we're getting attacked by the mainstream media, it's like you don't want all of your eggs in one basket. You don't, I mean, that's a natural tendency for somebody who, you know, um, wants to keep an audience, is like latch on to another producer, like form a partnership. But in the overall scheme of things, like if you think of like, a, like the food industry in a, in, a, in a town, like Austin, Texas, like the food trailers, it's like decentralization has made that an amazing food town. And it's because you're isolating the food. You know, you're not making it about politics. You're not making it about clicks. That's why I got off all the Facebook groups because it was just sort of like, ah, it's, it's like this guy hates me and now I'm banned from like eight forums. You know, it's like I don't want to see that on YouTube. I don't want to see it on uh, websites. I can't control that. And if people want to do that, that's fine. But I think a wiki 
as far as resources, a place to go where everybody knows, you know, they try to shut us down using this dialectic, here's where you find it, boom, that's great. Um, but otherwise, I mean, decentral decentralization is always my favorite. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, I don't like things homogenized myself, but I do like this idea that we're talking about here. And until the wiki is, is up and running, and I don't even know how to start one, maybe somebody here does or maybe somebody watching does, uh, we can host on our own channel several videos that address many of the concerns. And I know, Mark, on your channel, you've got some good stuff. And David, you also have an area where people can go and get some of the best Flat Earth videos. So can either of you... Uh, I'll go with Mark first, because just because I'm staring at you. Nice. Where on your channel are good videos? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I try to mention it in everything I do. You know, I point people. It's like, look, just go into YouTube or any search engine and type. Well, if you're if you're in YouTube, you just type in Flat Earth and don't set a filter. If you're going to set it, uh, set it for you know when it was 2015, said to, to, you know, just one year. But I put up a list, you know, I know I've got to modify it, but I try to change it every once in a while. I call it the Flat Earth Shortlist because, like Rob, I get emails all the time from, you know, brand new people. It's like, I just started getting into this. Where can I learn more? It's like, I am not going to list everything. It's like, look, here's a playlist. I call it my Flat Earth Shortlist. There's only like 24 videos in there, uh, you know, and, and I pick them kind of rated on easy to digest. You know, not not super long, uh, not super short. Well, some of them are pretty short. And th so I said, look through this. It's got a very taste for everybody. And when you get through it, you're probably going to have a lot more questions. But at least you'll see where to go from there. And uh, other than that, you know, I point people to to Rob's website, testing the globe, if they're if they're heavy into Christian belief. Uh, if they're not, I'll, I maybe I'll point them at Jaren's stuff. It really it really varies. But the great thing about what what's out there now. And you and I have talked about this, Patricia. Is there so much content? Oh my God, is there a lot of content? To where, yeah, if you type in flat earth into YouTube now and just sort by relevance, I mean, yeah, most of the cream rises to the top. Of course, there's going to be some crap out there like uh, uh, Z Sauce, I'm sorry, Vsauce, and a few other you know debunker guys that are that are out there. But most of it is pro, and and most of it is very very good. I mean, I remember um, not to, not to drag this out, but I remember when when we were kind of first doing this last year, where Vsauce was always always at the top, and now he is just buried, even though he's got a, a one video called, you know, Is the Earth Really Flat? It's got 8 million hits. He's buried under everybody else that's doing all the pro stuff. So, there's a lot of great stuff out there. It's not, it is not hard to find. I have never run into anybody who has said, I still can't find anything good. It's just everybody's individual journey. Some people take longer than others to find it. Mm -hmm. And David, you've got a, a way people can find good information. It's, yeah, so I get the same thing. People asking, uh, you know, all the same questions. So on deepinsidetherabbithole.com, I have um, a flat earth page. And right at the top is Mark Sargent's clues, you know, if uh, you want to start there. Um, and I've got, you know, it, it's grown into a, a list that's getting kind of too long. But I tell people, you know, if you go through there, every question is answered. I'm starting a second page. If you, It, it says uh, just FE under construction. Um, where it's it's the most common questions. You know, why doesn't the sun set? How does the sun set on a flat Earth? And then I have you know a short video, a medium video, and a long video attached to that. So um, you can go and just read the questions and go right to it. I've only got three or four questions so far, but um, it's a uh, work in progress. So um, you know, people that go there and spend the time um, rather than wanting their lunch served to them in a YouTube comment thread um, will learn that you know will get many and most of their questions answered. So it's a great idea for content providers, if you decide to do so, to maybe have a little playlist there where you've got a couple of Flat Earth videos that you think are good for people who are new to things. That would be something you could do really quickly as a YouTube content provider, and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to put videos there uh, in varying lengths and uh, from varying people. Uh, and it may not even be people who like me. It doesn't really matter. It's what the material that's the most important thing. Uh, Jesse, it looks like you were going to say something. Yeah, just just real quick. Um, like, let's say you're uh, like I think this would be perfect if you're an entrepreneur or a developer who came here because you read the article uh, from the Guardian today. Like, there's a, a wide open market for somebody to develop like an Android or iPhone app that basically takes what we're already doing, going to the today filter on YouTube, and somehow randomizing it or selecting based on a certain criteria, maybe making a website that's just, uh, what do you call it, uh, 
uh, propagates all the different videos. If you figure out some way to make the the structure or the actual like filtering through flat Earth videos more simple, I think there's a wide open market for somebody to do that, and no problem, you know. And it doesn't have to be any one of the people on the panel. There may be somebody right now that we're not aware of who is doing such a thing. They have a website, and so that could be something that it will be brought to our attention in the comment section. But because we're not aware of it, that's not good. We need to somehow know what that is, be aware of it, and be able to talk about it when we do interviews, shows, make videos. So whoever's doing that sort of thing, put it in the comments and, and make us aware. Obviously, we're not uh, the rulers of Flat Earth and we, we don't have all the information. Nobody does. We're all pretty much on the same page or plane, as the case may be. All right, so where do we take it from here, guys? Anybody else have something that they wanted to specifically address? I did want to ask you a little bit about your show, Mark, last night because it speaks to proofs of the Flat Earth. But is there anything anybody wants to talk about uh, before we get there that touches on what we just got finished talking about. Mm, we'll just go with you, Mark. Yes, Mark. Sorry, I, sorry no, no, I had to turn off my, my mic. Uh, real quick, uh, it, just to address the, uh, the content that's out there, more often, especially over the last six months, what I've seen more than anything wasn't that the people couldn't find things, was more often, I'm sure you've all gotten emails along these lines, where they, they say, look, I haven't slept for literally like seven or eight days because <laughs> there's so many hundreds of hours that, you know, it's like, they just, it's like, it's like if you're in a video store, you know, if anyone still goes to video stores, and you're open, like a whole new room that you never even knew was there, and they just, they're digesting so much, and then at the end, it's like, I haven't slept in eight days, and I have questions. And it's like, you know what, go to sleep for two or three days, and then come back to me, and generally they're okay. So, just to let you know, that's really the more of the emails I've been getting lately. I get the emails that, please give me the, I'm interested in Flat Earth, and I've watched, you know, a, a couple of videos, and uh, I, I need a video that explains how the sun works, and I will always stop what I'm doing, wherever I am, even pull over if I'm in my car, try to find a video on the sun that's one that I at least like, you know, and understand that doesn't have any disinformation in it or anything weird, and then I send that to that person. But of course that's just me judging that. It would be nice if we had a place where there were many other people, especially people who've made those videos, had it all compiled together. So we can do it now on our own channel and have a few videos, and in the future maybe there will be, or maybe there already is, a place where this all can be put. So that's a good idea towards solving the problem, getting more information out there. Now Mark, I wanted to talk about proofs and we don't have Ashley Webster and we all have been involved in one level of experimentation or another, at least even if it's going out and looking over water and seeing the ships, that sort of thing. So Mark, you had somebody on your channel, uh, excuse me, on uh, your uh, TFR on your, um, on your show last night, uh, yep. uh, Strange World. Tell us who that person was and what was discussed. It, it was a retired Air Force navigator, uh, so career Air Force, specialized in air-to-air -air refueling, long hauls, uh, thousands of hours in the air from a military standpoint, also a private pilot, uh, currently working for a government agency, I can't say, and, you know, very, very knowledgeable also. I think I sent you, you probably haven't seen it yet, Rob, also a very strong Christian which is really what prompted him to come forward because in his mind, you know, the truth, uh, you know, the spiritual truth is more important than anything. And yeah, we talked for two hours about, you know, why he thinks, basically he laid it out, why he thinks it's um, flat, you know, why, why he thinks it's a flat enclosed world. And again, he's just one of a series, that's really what I've been focusing on more than anything. Uh, you know, a lot of people are doing experiments and everything, but since the people have been, you know, because it's easy because I put my phone number and my contact info out, uh, I've been focusing on the, the subject matter experts that really, you know, they have credibility. You know, for, again, uh, real quick, you know, down the line, uh, Navy missile instructor, Navy submarine chief, Army artillery radar operator, Marine Corps sniper instructor, a private flight instructor, an industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals, a career surveyor, international shipping extra expert and a corporate corporate travel agent all have relevant opinions on this subject and what's been amazing to me is not only has have none of them contradicted each other you know it's not like not, not one of them has you know and everybody knows you know the other interviews but not not one of them has come back uh, either before or after and said no no they were wrong here they were wrong there and this is the part I put out to debunkers any debunkers that are listening out there 
if you're just going to come out and try to debunk it and say flat earth is dumb and here's my proofs, that for me it doesn't make any difference anymore because you have to go up against all these guys now. Come, find me, find, if you're a debunker, find me a professional that will come on air or at least give you a statement or something. Somebody from the military. So, I mean, uh, Patricia, you had a structural engineer uh, and a radio operator. Nobody's come out against these guys. I would, I would have thought, and I don't want to get off on a rant here, but I would have thought that at least... Uh, a physicist, fine. We we have a really really tough time finding a physicist that'll go on air and do any debates. Uh, uh, you know, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson turned uh, me down flat, and we got Stanton Friedman, which is the closest thing we could get. But you would think that a physicist, even if it wasn't live, would have done a pre-recorded anonymous thing on YouTube or put a statement out or sent something to a flat earther, and they haven't. And for me, that's the most satisfying thing. That's where I, for me, that's where it's going. I mean, I just did an Air Force guy yesterday. So I've got all the branches of military service. And Air Force is really just one notch below NASA, in my opinion, because most of them come from Air Force anyway. So that's, that's what I'm focusing on at this point. And I, that's, that's the juice for me. All right. All right, the next thing we should probably talk about, since we were discussing proofs, would be what's your favorite proof? And we're going to start with Ben, Matrix Decode. What would yours be? Okay, um, well, there are several, in my opinion, but I mean, uh, you know, the, the Sala Dione salt flats in Bolivia, for me, are a big indication, uh, you know, real proof that the Earth is flat. And because, you know, the, the way they were formed over thousands of years due to water leveling, uh, and there's like less than one meter uh, height difference. Across most of the most of the salt flats, so um, you know, if this for me is one of the, is the strongest proofs, um, and also you know, across looking across uh, when you, you now I've conducted the Bedford Bedford level experiment before, looking across the sea, and you know the curvature is just there is no curvature, and um, I've been re I've redone the experiment again recently, and um, you know boats don't sink over the horizon and. Uh, and so on, and um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of different proofs, but yeah, if I had to pick one, I'd say the, the Saladoni salt flats, you know, that's uh, it's hard to dismiss, hard to debunk. All right, thank you very much, and we'll go to you next, David Weiss. Favorite proof that you found? Um, my favorite proof would have to be the fact that the Earth doesn't move and every sense that you have tells you that it doesn't move. Um, you know, it, it, the, the experiment of uh, shooting a, a cannonball straight up in the air, that thing would have to accelerate because it's going a, a you know, farther distance when it's up in the air. But, you know, there's been many times where it's come down and gone right back in the cannon. Um, you know, airplanes taking off from the equator versus a high northern or, you know, or southern, outer southern um, spot would be traveling at different speeds. It would make it impossible to land. So just everything about the Earth moving, it just says it doesn't move. All right. Up next, Jesse Spots. Favorite proof of flat Earth or favorite proof of an aspect of flat Earth? Um, optics. Just, um, you know, everybody loves the boat going over the horizon thing, and it's it's not easy to explain somebody, you know, if your binoculars only show the boat going so far, get a more powerful pair of binoculars. There's photos of cliffs going into the horizon and showing the vanishing point. And just if you just show somebody a photo of, of, of the perfect perspective cliffs vanishing over the horizon, a person intuitively knows that those cliffs aren't getting smaller just like the boat isn't vanishing. That's my favorite proof. It's one that people don't use that often. Um, there's probably like a particular cliff, like the cliffs of Dover or something that I could tell a person, but it's, it's just that particular perspective of photo. It's just obvious that it has everything to do with optics and nothing to do with the curve of the Earth. All right, thank you. Mark Sargent, your favorite proof of the flat Earth. Um, my favorite proof would is not... Is not the actual proof of the flat Earth, but the negation of the globe. Meaning, you know, something that I've talked about, and that is, yeah, all flat Earthers can't agree necessarily on the exact shape and scale and, and size and color and everything that's going on with the flat Earth. But what we can all agree on is that the globe, which is why I, I love um, uh, Rob's 
uh, the title of his website is testingtheglobe.com, which is basically there's something wrong with the globe model. So my proof is my trap question, which I love using, and which is why all physicists will fall eventually, and which is the Van Allen belts. Which is, and I know it sounds you know innocuous at first, but the Van Allen belt trap question is, okay, if the Van Allen belts announced in 1959 are the deadliest thing ever, uh, then how did Apollo um, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 make round trips through it? Uh, the capsule didn't con get contaminated. Nobody died from radiation poisoning. Nobody got cancer afterwards. What shielding did you use? How did you get past it? And 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 the trap is because they'll say, well, which is why I threw it at, at Stanton Friedman. And and I go because I knew I know where it's going. And I said, are they deadly? He goes, well, they're obviously not not very dangerous. And it's like, oh, that's fantastic, great. You can look up on the internet right now. Just type in Orion trial by fire, which is a little NASA video we've all probably seen at this point, uh, hosted by a guy named uh, I think it was Kelly Smith. It's on NASA's website right now, which shows that basically it's a little seven or eight minute video, a promo piece, what they actually put on television, I think on the Discovery Channel, where it talks about how the dangers of the Orion program and how they've got to get through the Van Allen radiation belts and they're not going to send any manned things through this thing until they can figure out how to solve the radiation problem. And it was as clear as day and they were very specific about dealing with the radiation problems. Okay, why are you saying that if you already solved the radiation problem in the 60s? Because you're, you're screwed either way. Either, either you solved it in the 60s or you didn't. If you solved it, then what would you do? Forget about how, to, how, how you got through it? And if you didn't solve it, then you never went. So it's a no-win situation. It's a trap question, and there is no way to beat it, in my opinion. So even though it doesn't prove the flat Earth, it sure as hell proves that there's absolutely something wrong uh, with the globe model because NASA is hiding everything. All right, makes complete sense. And Rob Skiba, you're the last one in the panel to ask, ask, answer the question, and I actually know what your answer is going to be. So please let us know what one of your favorite proofs is for the flat Earth. Do you now? <laughs> well, uh, well, naturally, from my worldview, I would say the biblical evidence. Um, you know, uh, and, and this is something that I, I deal with all the time. Is that especially people out there that in, like Ken Hoven, who are in the King James only crowd. I'm like, okay, if you're going to hold a biblical, literal point of view, and you're going to be King James only at that, you, welcome to the Flat Earth Society, <laughs> because. It is unquestionably a flat earth book from Genesis to Revelation. I just did my first um, live conference seminar on the subject. I've certainly produced a ton of videos and written blogs and stuff, but I was invited to speak up in Oklahoma this past weekend, and I titled the, the weekend conference, it was just me, I titled it, titled it The Genesis Revelation. And I was just like, okay, guys, let's start with Genesis 1. And I went through it. And, you know, the... the the biblical record, but not just the biblical Hebra Hebraic, you know, from the Hebrew mindset. It's the entire ancient world. I mean, everybody had some variant of basically the snow globe. So, you know, that's that's my number one. But when it comes to that issue, that and people want to fight it, I say, what do you do with the stars? What are the stars? If we are in a dome, and Genesis starts right off in chapter one, saying that the sun, moon, and stars are placed inside the dome then the stars cannot be what, what modern science is trying to tell us it is. And you've got four very powerful witnesses that say something that we have, from a Christian worldview, we have to deal with. Isaiah, Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, Yeshua, Peter and John, all four of these guys say, in no uncertain terms, all the stars are going to fall to the earth. And I simply said, okay, guys, if we say, and everybody that I talked to, I mean, I had about 80 people in the audience, and they all agreed, we take the Bible literally. I said, okay, you all said you take the Bible literally. If this is true, then forget about ISIS, forget about Obama, the Antichrist, the coming, whatever you want to freak out about right now. We've got bigger problems if Andromeda is heading our way. <laughs> uh, because it says all the stars are going to fall. So, you know, that's been a fascinating study for me. About a week or two before that conference, I was in Lubbock, and Lubbock, Texas. If uh, if you want to believe in flat Earth, all you got to do is go to Lubbock, Texas. It is flat in every direction you look. And I met this guy, this older guy, 
And he says, oh, yeah, he's, he's putting stickers up everywhere. <laughs> you know, Do you really know the world you live in? Go to Testing the Globe, you know. Uh, he says, come on, here, come over here. And he shows me outside. He says, I take these powerful binoculars, and I find anybody I can that will listen to me. Say, hey, look over there. What do you see? Well, that's such and such a town. Oh, well, you know, that's 15 miles away or 20 miles or 30 miles away. What do you see over there? Oh, that's such and such a city. Well, that's, you know point is, all these people are seeing things they shouldn't be able to see. So that would be out of my top five. Uh, you know, you got the biblical issue, number one. Number two uh, would be the skyline and horizon issues. The Joshua Nowicki picture, man, I mean, we have got to deal with that. I've got some tests lined up uh, that if everything goes well, we plan on doing some really cool tests in the, in the spring. I want to do it before it gets too warm. I want to definitely do it in the cold weather. Uh, as long as the uh, lake is not too hostile. We were actually going to go in December, and we were trying to charter a boat to go across because they say the weatherman says it's a mirage. Well, if it's a mirage, and he said it's because the cold air in the water meets the warm air and you get the inversion and blah, blah, blah. I said, fine, let's go when it's cold, when the water and the air is cold. And my friend Rick Hummer tells me that he lives not too far from that area where Joshua and Nowicki took the picture. Everybody's seen Chicago. So I want to do a man on the street interview, just talking to people. Hey, what do you think about you know the Chicago skyline? Oh yeah, we've seen it all the time. And then show them the math, watch the you know the gerbil jump off the wheel, <laughs> and then charter a boat. Because what I want to do, I, I met another guy who can build a, a gimbals to keep a, a camera stationary. I want to rig a platform on a boat, point it at Chicago on a day that it's visible, and just drive right toward it with the camera on the whole time. Uh, because if it's a mirage, then it's going to magically disappear, and then the city will roll up over the ball, and okay. But if it's not a mirage, then it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in the camera. So that's another big favorite of mine. Um, I'm not sure where to rank this one, but another huge one is uh, geocentricity. Uh, and those, if you guys haven't seen this documentary yet, and anybody watching, you have to go see uh, uh, the documentary The Principle. Just look up the principal movie. I think it's the principal uh, Download that movie. You know, watch it. Because even if it seems like geocentricity and flat Earth really kind of go hand in hand, because everything that we believe today is based on the the fact of a heliocentric spinning world thing. But like David said, this place is stationary, and this movie really proves it in a very professional way. So that's another big one. Um, and then the gyroscopes and planes and submarines and things like that. Uh, so these are all things I'm, I'm excited about. Um, and, oh, and one more. The same guy that was in Lubbock with the binoculars, he had one of those uh, laser thermal tester guns where you just point it and, it and it tells you the temperature. And it was a half moon outside, clear night, and he showed me that the moon was giving off cold light. And, and so immediately I went out and bought one, and now it's a couple more days now. It'll be a full moon. I'm excited to do some of my own tests. But, I mean, that's just crazy. That We're told that the moon is a reflector of the sunlight, and yet the sun's direct light is warm, and it's cooler in the shadow, whereas the moon's light is warm in the shadow and cold in direct moonlight. Mind-blowing stuff. The experiment you're talking about doing is is very cool, very exciting, and something that nobody has done before with the boat and the gimbal and all the things that you discussed. I grew up partially anyway in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and would go to Chicago every once in a while with my mom and dad, go do some shopping or go see a play or something. And I never thought to look for something like that because I was a teenager and even younger. But uh, you know, I, I I need to contact somebody who lives over there and just ask them what they see and uh, what they what they uh, what they experience living there. Uh, Mark. Oh yeah, just real quick to add to, to Rob's thing uh, about the moon. I actually include, even though Jonathan gives me a bunch of crap for it, because when he first heard it, he thought it was ridiculous, and yet he's on a Flat Earth show, the, um, which was the moon thing. I actually include that in my Flat Earth shortlist, uh, a video that links, I don't know if it's in Sandy and Sandy's or one of the other people that have done it, but that that's no joke. It's absolutely, yeah, that's one of those things, it's a cool little proof where, yeah, the moonlight is cold. It's, a, it's got a cooling effect, which absolutely negates what we've been told about reflecting the sun's light, which means it's its own illumination system. And once that thing's in your head, everything starts to fall apart. Because like, okay, what exactly is the moon, and why have you been telling us this about the moon? And again, why has nobody noticed until now? It's brilliant. Rob, do you have something else to add? Well, yeah, also when the blood moons was all the rage and we had the last blood moon, 
Uh, I went out on the roof of my building, it has a parking garage, and I and I watched the moon pop up at about seven o'clock. Uh, as the sun was going down at about 7.15. So both were up on the horizon about the same time. About 7.45, 8 o'clock or so, it started to turn blood red. But here's the problem. It's like, here's the, here's the moon, I'm the Earth, the sun's going down behind me. You think that the shadow of the Earth should have come up like this. But it didn't. It came in from the north. So, you know, all this issues with the sun and moon and stuff, I, I think it's very exciting. Uh, none of us questioned it before. I've seen many eclipses. Never thought about it, like you said, Patricia. You know, we never thought about these things. But now, as we're starting to think about them and, and observing these things, probably for the first time in our life, it's not adding up. One of my favorite proofs, everyone took all the other ones, all the good ones, uh, is not really a proof of flat Earth, but it calls calls the ball Earth into doubt, which are these independent balloons and rockets that have been launched and show what appears to be a flat earth and at the same height in which NASA shows us a ball earth and uh, that right there shows us it doesn't prove flat earth it proves NASA is lying now I know there's a lot of people and we've all run across them who say NASA lies but yet I believe we live on a globe or we don't live on a flat earth that's a hard thing for me to wrap my head around but these are some of the things that we're up against with people who uh, are not into the flat earth and I don't expect everyone to be into the flat earth. I'm not a flat earth evangelist. I'm not trying to convert people to be a flat earther. I'm just very passionate about this subject, very curious about this subject, and want to talk about this subject with other people who are interested in this subject and with people who are curious about it, even if they, in the end, remain convinced that they live on a ball. All right, so who wanted to add something? I saw someone raise their hand. I think it was uh, Ben, maybe? No? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go yeah. Ahead. I mean, thanks, Patricia. Uh, yeah. Jesse mentioned uh, boats over the horizon and uh, being an optical illusion, and that is definitely the case. Um, I mean, we we see we see boats that appear to be a mirage hovering in the sky, but with the calm sea, with a calm sea and the perfect conditions. And I've been out recently filming this, documented this, and been doing various experiments down at the beach again. But you know, you can see. Um, that the boat isn't actually a mirage floating in the sky at like say like eight, seven to ten miles away. It appears to be so. The horizon is a bit below the boat and the boat's floating in the sky but with the right conditions you can zoom in and you can see pull the whole sea that's supporting that boat so the boat's actually sitting upon the sea. Uh, you know it's, it's, a, it's a total, you know I've not seen anyone else do that before and I've captured it on, on, on video and photographed it and the, the conditions were so perfectly calm, and the lighting was perfect, and it was able to pick up the sea below the boat, beyond the horizon, what appears to be the horizon. So this is this is very fascinating, um, and that's going to be in my next video that I put out. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that because it really is a, a lot of optical illusions going on, and things that we haven't been able to detect until recently with the technology that we now have with these powerful cameras. Um, I wanted to add a couple more proofs. I mean, um, planes traveling at 500 miles an hour and not dipping their noses 2,000 plus feet every minute. You know, I think planes are called aeroplanes because they fly on a plane. The horizon rises to eye level at varying altitudes, which should not be possible on a ball. The, the horizon should drop down further and keep dropping down as you rise higher and higher. But that's not what we see from various, from whether it's planes or high altitude balloons weather balloons and so on. Uh, another one is the lack of star parallax as we hurtle through the, the universe at hundreds of thousands of miles an hour and nothing ever changes. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a few extra things I wanted to add and you know we can break, I mean the ball earth um, model is full of so many holes that we could just keep going on about so many different things about how it just, not, just doesn't work out and something like gravity is just is just a, a, a ridiculous myth. It's complete nonsense, you know. So, I mean, how how that's holding down uh, mi trillions and trillions of tons of ocean water and c making it curve and so on. Yeah, everything else people can jump up and down easily. Flies, everything can move away from gravity. And uh, yeah, the, the whole spinning ball mo Earth model is a uh, universe model is complete nonsense. 
Thank you very much, Ben. Our next topic is going to be about things that are difficult for us to explain, but does anybody have anything else to add to this previous topic before we move along? David? Yeah, one of, one of my favorite proofs is um, the lack of something, and it, we, we mentioned it at the beginning, was uh, Math Powerland's new video about how come NASA can't give us 24 hours of the Earth spinning uninterrupted. You know, put something on the moon, put a satellite, you know, out between us and the sun. Um, you know, obviously they can do that because they showed us that, that wonderful moon transit cartoon uh, not too long ago. Um, and the cost to do that would be far less than the advertising budget of many major corporations. I mean, just imagine if NASA put it out there and then you could put your logo on it and people would watch it in real time. You know, when, when there's a big storm coming, um, they, it would, they could charge more for their advertising rates. It would be a huge revenue income. Mark talks about this all the time. Not done. Can't be done. I mean, and then the people that are like, oh, it already exists. You look at these videos, they are bad cartoons at best. So the fact that we don't have that, you know, opens up the entire can of worms. Yes, uh, Jesse, something else to add on that subject. I just want to say, if you're uh, maybe a business entrepreneur or maybe you just saw the Guardian article, that's a market. If you own a satellite and you want to maybe put your own corporate satellite in space and show us the image of the Earth, there's a market for that as well. Interesting. You always have these good ideas where people could make money. It just doesn't seem like they're able to do it, though. <laughs> so, um, Mark Sargent, what do you have for us? Oh, yeah, yeah. Real quick to, to, to what Jesse was saying. The uh, it's it's one of the videos that's on my short list and it doesn't get a lot of traction but I think it's a brilliant little video and it, that was the guy that pretended to be a Hollywood producer called up the NASA trademark office and said yeah you know could, pretty much snowed him convinced him he was he was from Hollywood it's like look I need some stock footage of the Earth rotating on its axis and the 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 NASA trademark guy he got to exactly the right guy said yeah we don't we don't have that and he had him on speakerphone he's like you don't have it. He goes, no, which really negates the only footage we've got, which was the one that Matt tore apart, which is the Galileo footage of 1990 showing, you know, a 24-hour rotation and the weather doesn't change, that basically NASA has disavowed even that. Even that they won't shovel off to Hollywood and say, yeah, yeah, use that. No, they won't even, they're not even going to take that chance. So, yeah, the market's absolutely out there. There's nobody... Again, forget about the photos, full-blown photos of the Earth from space and direct sunlight. There's not a single motion picture video, and that Japan crap doesn't count because that's geostationary. There's no full motion video of the Earth rotating uh, in space over any time frame. It's, it's it's unbelievable that nobody has actually called attention to this. So, All right, so we're done with this particular topic, although we could probably go on for a while on it. What about things that we have trouble explaining? Who wants to start it all off? Things that they find confusing, still head scratchers. Maybe Rob, because you're still not a hundred percent flat earther. What what are the things that keep you keep you a little bit, you know, maybe not on the globe, but just wondering? When I first got into it, the two big sticking points I have were the Coriolis effect and the lunar eclipses. I've since, at least in my own mind, resolved those. I don't; those are not a problem for me anymore. I, that's that's not an issue. Um, but there's still, I mean, the, the most flack that I get uh, in emails and Facebook posts and YouTube comments and stuff like that is coming from people in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, alleged some is Southern Hemisphere, uh, Australia, New Zealand, you know, down there. And it's the, the issue of the flights. Uh, I met a guy who uh, was a cook for uh, Lockheed Martin and Raytheon who was stationed in Antarctica for, uh, I think he said, three years. And he spent a lot of time down there, and he would fly from base to base. And on the ball, the flight distances, you know, and he would tell me, you know, how long the flights were and stuff like that, uh, make perfect sense on the, the ball model. On the current flat earth, or if we call it the, the AE map, there's no way. Uh, you know, on the same roadblock that uh, stumped Tiger Dan, was something that stumped me, you know, early on in this, and I'm like, well, we can't just ignore this. We can't just say, oh well, you know, uh, this is a pretty huge issue. And the second one to that, that I ran into even at the conference that I was at, it, you know, you guys have probably seen the animations I've done with the, uh, you know, the sun basically, you know, doing the thing over the disc, uh, and the whole issue of supposedly being able to see the sun 
uh, you know, 24 hours a day down in Antarctica. What I'm trying to figure out, maybe you guys can help me with this uh, if you know, is whether or not they actually see the disk of the sun for 24 hours or it's just light for 24 hours. From what I could tell, it seems like it's just light for 24 hours when they do see the sun for a little while, but then the sun sort of goes out of their field of view, which would make sense even on the ball, uh, but it's still light. And if that's the case, then biblically speaking, the firmament is said to be mirror-like. And so it seems to me if the sun's on its outer circuit on the disk, that it could be reflecting around the disk, you know, uh, still giving the, the the light effect without actually seeing the, the, the orb or the disk of the sun itself. Those are the big ones that really have me stuck right now is the issue of the flights, uh, and, you know, supposedly going from Chile to Australia and seeing Antarctica when they do it. I don't know what to do with those. So, so Max said uh, in the comment section on his video on his flight, somebody asked if he saw the uh, ice in Antarctica, and he said no, he didn't see any um, it, because it was cloudy and he was over the wing. But again, that's not confirmation there. Also, the the light twenty four hours in Antarctica. Yes, yeah, some people are saying it, but you know, some people are saying a lot of stuff about nine eleven that isn't true and and other things. Haven't seen it. Jaren's video, which was, I believe was the response video to Tiger Dan, um, he showed the flags. You know, it's supposedly 24 mm -hmm. hours, and they're missing, you know, seven hours of the day. So maybe it does get dark. I don't know what time of year that was. It could have been, you know, it could have been anything. Haven't proved it yet. Haven't, you know, are, are, are thousands of people lying or are a couple people saying thousands of people are, are, are claiming it? We don't have proof yet. Yeah, there was Jesse, a. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Just uh, can you see my uh, what my screen? Let me see if I can do a screen share. Um, can you see my screen share right now? Yes. On, on my website. Okay, this is on the on my website, Testing the Globe. If you go to the main menu here, click on Conclusions. Um, there's a video that I put in here. Uh, I, this is all the stuff I agreed with at the top. All this stuff, and then right about here, the South Pole sky. This was a different video from the one that. That uh, that Jaron had, um, but okay. So if you watch the sun go out of the way there, and if I remember right, I'll oh, get this stupid ad out of the way. There's a shadow that starts to appear. Yeah, right here. See the shadow? This looks like the sun is going behind the camera, obviously. So this video is a lot more convincing than the one that Jaron showed. But my question was, how do I know this was shot in the south? This could have been shot in the north, and that would have made sense. I don't know. I can't verify it. But it does look like the sun definitely goes behind the camera and casts a shadow of that uh, structure in the foreground. Could, yeah. people, could people possibly be taken to the North Pole and told they're at the South Pole? You, you know, how do you know where you're going? You land on mm -hmm. some ice, and they could, be, they, could, they could have taken a couple groups of people you know, to the North Pole and uh, told them they were in Antarctica. Very interesting and very scary, if that is indeed the deception. Jesse Spots? Uh, another thing, well, uh, it's, it's great that we just saw that image, because another thing that people bring up about that image specifically is the sun turns into just like a black ball, or at least there's a black ball in front of a big glowing light. Yeah. And, and that really like rings true for me about the reflective property of the dome. And I know that a lot of YouTube producers are, that's exactly where they're at. Mr. Thrive and Survive, Drew7777, and myself. And this is actually where Tiger Dan and I started having our falling out, is basically how light works. And I'm all about that. Like, all about, like, is that black dot just, like, that happens to be a place in the firmament where the sun's a certain distance away, where you get that overwhelming glow of light, but that little beady black sun. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Mark Sargent, do you have something to add to this? You do not. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, no. No. Wait. Oh, I do. I do have one real quick thing, and that is and don't. We'll go to ben. Okay. Sorry. Don't discount what uh, David brought up uh, just a little while ago. That missing footage. That missing time lapse. Lapse footage. I watched that video, and that really bugged me because it was consistent all around. It was a big chunk of footage down, supposedly down the Antarctic, and that is okay. We're going to show you know the the sun, sun, and all of a sudden it's like. Let's cut out nine hours or whatever it was. You can tell because of the flag and the shadows. It suddenly just jumped. 
Well, not just that. Way. It was in. It was in the. It was in the timestamp. Yeah. It's, it's like, why? Why would this be missing everywhere? Why? Why? It just, and you wonder if they put things like that in there. Are they smart enough to trick us that they would change the timestamp and change the flags if they were? It's like all of this stuff that we see on the ISS. Why, yeah, they that's purposely it, doing you, it, or you know, it's it, just exactly. Yeah, of course. yeah. The project production values. Some seem like honest mistakes, and others seem blatant. So mm. anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tricks yeah. Have been. yeah, I mean, I, I saw the video with the the edited uh, Antarctica footage. It appears to be like only uh, 16 hours a day of uh, where they cut it. Uh, oh, we lost you. Uh, we didn't lose you off the show, but it cut out when you were speaking. So, speak again. All right, hopefully he knows that he has to exit and then come back, I believe. Is that the solution, guys? I think so. Yeah, mm -hmm. these things always happen. Uh, while we're waiting for Ben to do that, Rob Skiba, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, like I said, the the Jaren video. I mean, that's very peculiar that we're we're having the lost time the situation. Three sixty. Oh wait, uh, there he is. Ben is coming back in. Ben, we lost you for a couple of seconds. So can you start over at the beginning of your sentence? You've just now popped back in with your audio. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the the Antarctica footage where you see the edited footage where it appears to be like sixteen hours a day and it's cut over and over again. I saw that and and went on to. Uh, Antarctica.gov.au, the Australian part of uh, the research centres down there, is like Casey Station and so on. And then they show uh, on their website they show time lapse of the previous day's footage, um, 24 hours footage, and um, I'm seeing a full 360 degree uh, shadow. So the sun's going all the way around. Uh, so I think people should go and have a look at that. I mean, the Antarctica thing is a is a big issue. Is a is a is an issue for flat Earth, and uh, and another one for me is the the southern star trap, the southern polar star, which I've not seen enough evidence of it actually existing. You know, there's a lot of people in flat Earth who, uh, who live in the, the southern hemisphere, but no one's actually produced a, a video documenting this yet. And there's you know, there's only a few videos of it online and some dubious looking star child pictures. Um, so I mean, these are the, the the two issues for me that we face, but. Uh, you know the the evidence, oh, you know, is overwhelming in the flat Earth camp. I mean, there's so many more problems for the ball Earth model. So these issues regarding like the sky and the light and how the and how the sun behaves, it really is still a mystery, still to be solved. Thank you, Ben, Jesse. And at this point, this is just this is basically just a, a diatribe that I have said multiple times now, but. But I definitely think that the reflective nature of light is going to be the key to this. And the uh, analogy I've been using is when you take a pool shot, you have to walk around the table to the cue ball in order to line up your shot. A reflection is the same way with a mirror. If the dome, if the firmament is a mirror, perhaps that's how sunlight works. You know, People t standing 10 feet away from each other Maybe are they seeing the actual sun? Or are they seeing a reflection of the sun? Is it one side of the Earth sees the actual sun, the other side of the Earth sees a reflection of the sun? I don't know. But the reflective, you know, property of light is very hard to describe to somebody. That pool ball thing is one of the best ways I've been able to describe, and people know that intuitively. They just forget that light isn't a static object. Um, so angle of reflection and point of view are very important when describing light. All right, um, we're continuing on with the problems that we each individually have with the model, the flat earth model, little issues that are problematic, worrying us, making us scratch our heads. Who else would like to chime in? We'll go with Rob Skiba. Uh, something was mentioned, uh, I think uh, Jesse mentioned it, was the, um, the where something black goes in front of the sun. Uh, I think the official statement was that it's a camera issue, that the camera is like shutting down to protect its uh, circuitry and whatnot, which is possible, I suppose. But um, w when I was looking into the whole issue of the lunar eclipse and what was happening, uh, I kept finding these ancient texts talking about Rahu and Ketu uh, in, the, in the Hindu mythology, uh, that they and several others had this idea that there were dark orbs that are, are above us and that they were the ones that were actually responsible for uh, the eclipse. So I wonder, um, you know, if it's not a camera issue, 
and if you can still see the moon and the sun, and yet the sun's getting this black dot thing in front of it, if in fact that actually happens in real life, if that might be uh, evidence of the dark orbs that could be uh, up there. And what intrigues me about that is even in the heliocentric ball Earth universe, uh, you have people talking about dark matter, you have people talking about Nibiru, the dark planet. So there's a concept even in the spherical heliocentric model that accepts the idea of a dark orb uh, in our system. So, you know, could that be what, what's going on there? I don't know. I just I find it rather intriguing uh, and something worth looking into. Mark Sargent, what would you say would be something that you haven't quite wrapped your head around yet when it comes to the flat Earth? Um, probably the, the questions that are not many. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I've answered so many questions at this point that I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm fairly open to a lot of, of concepts. The Antarctic sun is probably the weakest. But at the same time, I, I you know, uh, do what Matrix was saying, and that is you focus on the huge amount of positives. I mean, let's not forget that that Eric made a, what was it, 200 proofs of a flat Earth? That's bold. All right, not 50, not 100, no, 200 proofs. And, and yeah, some are, are stronger than others. But that's why I'm, I'm never, uh, you know, as far as confidence and conviction, conviction goes, I never worry because there's so much stuff on the flatter side, and the science side is so unbelie unbelievably weak. Which, which, and they don't even know how weak it is most of the time. Uh, so no, no, not not much at all. Again, the Antarctic sun maybe, uh, but I still, you know, there's simulations now that we can deal with it. I mean, we have the technology now to build this on a much much smaller scale, and uh, and and that's why I try to. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one thing and and. I know this is going to sound childish, but and some people have heard me say it before, which is the the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, analogy, which I throw out there, and that is, look, that's a that's a Disneyland ride. You go to the last part of that Disneyland ride, and you come into this open harbor, and it gives you your illusion that you are in a, basically a limitless har harbor with a horizon in the distance. You go into that. You're in a boat when you go into this ride. You tell me how far away those stars are. You tell me where that moon is. You tell me how it was done. Because that was built in the 60s with wood and simple lighting. That's easy. And you still can't tell me. Uh, you, it's like, hey, how far away is that horizon line? Is it 50 yards? Is it 100 yards? It could be miles. You couldn't tell the difference. That's how, uh, how easy we, we fall for illusions. Now think what you can do with some really good technology. And that's what, uh, what I try to hit people when they say, oh, you know, try to explain this. Is Look, just open your mind. You'll, you'll figure it out eventually. And by technology, some might say we would replace that word with creator, uh, God. Go. So that's I want that put out well, there for well, all. No, we he, have I've said opinions. before, even, even God has his tools. You know, even God has to build with something. I'm just saying. Sorry, Rob. Go ahead. Rob, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I you know, one of the things I appreciate about uh, what Mark brings to the table as a video game programmer, especially now that I'm working on a video game too and starting to figure out how you know how to program stuff like that is if we are able to conceive of these things with our finite limited human minds then obviously the creator could have figured out the same thing like when I first started thinking about the scriptures tell us in multiple places that the moon is a lesser light. It gives its own light. That's what it says in the text. And you know, the test we're going out there and showing it doesn't appear to be a reflector because it's giving off completely different light. So I started to rack my brain. It's like, okay, how is this thing giving off its own light? And early on in my investigations, I created a 3D model showing how the moon could be self-illuminating. Now there are problems with the model. I acknowledge that, but basically I was able to create a 3D model that still allowed the moon to create its own phases if it was self-illuminating. And right after I did that, I ended up finding, I, don't, I forgot who makes it, Hasbro or somebody, I don't remember who, who makes it, but the moon in my room, you can get it at Walmart, uh, and you know it's a, this half sphere that you can stick up on your wall, and by remote control, you can click it, and it will go through the phases of an illuminated moon in your bedroom. I'm going, well, I mean, if toy manufacturers can figure this out, then, then surely the creator of, of this uh, terrarium could figure it out at well. So figure it out as well. So to, to Mark's point, you know, from a programming perspective, sure, uh, the creator could make these things however he wants. And, and this actually came up in the discussion this weekend in the Q&A was um, 
when it talk, the Bible talks about a coming great delusion, a, a great deception that could be so great that even the elect could be deceived by it. Well, if you look at that text, it actually says God sends it. God is the one who sends the great delusion. So I was thinking about that. I was going, well, you know, this is certainly a wonderful candidate for the great delusion because so many people are deceived by the spinning heliocentric globe thing that, I mean, wow. I mean, that's what makes evolution even remotely plausible. The whole ancient aliens thing, you know, all of that is is only really possible with the, you know, Earth in a small corner of an ever-expanding universe idea. Uh, so I thought, what if the creator or the programmer of this simulation set things up in such a way that depending on your preconceived bias and belief system, you could see it either way. In other words, if you, if you go into this fully convinced that we're in a spinning heliocentric ball, you know, a model in an ever-expanding universe, then all of your observations reinforce that belief. But if you go into it with the, the belief that the Bible means exactly what it says and says what it means, then we're in a snow globe, well, I mean, I can say for myself, as soon as I had that seed planted in my head, you know, like the movie Inception, you know, once I had that planted in my head, that's all I see now. I, I, everything I look around, everything looks different. It doesn't look like it used to look like before. So, you know, I'm wondering if that's the way it was all, if this matrix, if you will, was programmed, that it's up to the observer uh, to decide what it is that we're actually seeing. Very interesting, and I know, uh, Mark, you've said something along those lines, even when it comes to the uh, what is surrounding us, some call it a dome, the firmament, which I know are different things, but you've said something along the lines of, we may never be able to actually touch it and offer the proof that bald earthers are asking for, uh, because it may move with the perception. Can you kind of go over that a little bit more for those oh, who don't yeah, understand? Yeah. It's a yeah. theory, of course, but it's well, something yeah, of worth course. considering. There, there's something that, that uh, uh, game, or not just game programmers, but all sorts of simulation programmers have built in over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, uh, and that's called a soft barrier. And that is, it's not a hard barrier where you walk up and clunk, you know, you walk into it. It's literally got a pushback. So it's got its own uh, G-force that, that pushes back against you. So eventually you're walking, you're walking or flying or doing whatever, and you realize that you're still walking physically, but you look down and the rock that sit next to you on the ground hasn't moved because the forward motion is gone. Uh, and they they do that so that you don't actually conflict with the actual physical barrier. I know everyone's talked about you know a uh, you know a glass or a heavy element or a water or a force field or anything like that. Uh, but the the goal is is that you don't want anyone to get super close to the uh, you don't want actually someone to actually be able to walk up and touch it. Uh, that it's got its own physical um, properties. It's got its own physics working for it. So, yeah, I, again, it's something that it, it seemed very, very efficient because, again, it, 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 at least in the, in the simulation world, it's really annoying to have players or people interacting with it walking up because all they're going to do is pound on the, on the wall. So you just keep them, it's kind of like you're hitting them with a wind and you're pushing them up, uh, away from it so they never actually reach it and they give up and they go back the other way. So. All right, very interesting. I yeah. am looking right now. Thank you for doing that because it's yep. a hard concept to explain to someone. Yep. Because oh, by the way, they, they also throw in uh, a little added thing to even mess you up even more. It's called a, um, it's like a digital fog uh, where you're walking forward and, and your, your field of vision, it's like a fog that gets thicker and thicker to where literally you cannot see two inches in front of your face. And that's also a deterrent to keep you from, from going forward. Just something I'd throw in there. All right. Anybody else have anything to add to any of this before we potentially go to chat, which moves very fast, but I'm, I've just asked in chat using my cell phone uh, to, uh, to anyone who's watching to ask a question and address it to the particular panel member. But David Weiss, what did you have to add? Uh, no, I, I was actually just thinking back. I wanted to comment. Mark had um, a guy on from uh, the Armed Services uh, talking uh, about his experience there, but he was also very religious, and uh, he was talking about the Bible a lot. And he brought up a really good point, which um, I, I, I kind of rang with me, that um, the reason that you know baller, ball supporters 
act so violently when presented with flat earth truth, I call it, um, is because the entire ball earth concept is a satanic concept to separate us from God. And when, you know, when that is influencing you and you are trying to break free, it's kind of like an exorcism, you know, when the priest is coming up trying to throw some truth at the person, they react violently. And, you know, people are reacting um, unlike themselves, uh, very negatively, you know, going back to Tiger Dan. Look at the way this guy's reacting from the, the Tiger Dan we knew earlier. There is some satanic influence in there. And I really can't even believe I'm saying this at this point because I never <laughs> believed in any of this stuff. Yeah, and, and David and I were talking about this morning, and, and he's absolutely right. Find me, and I'm sure all you guys would agree, find me another topic, and I don't care what it is, you know, church versus state, abortion, take your pick. I have never seen a topic generate this much polarization before to where, and you'd think it's just two words, it's just flat earth where people are just swinging in, in, in the forums. I mean, just going at it. So I, it's just amazing to me. Yeah, it's, it's like they're locked in, and trying to break out of it is actually more painful then, uh, yeah, when we are trying to accept it, you're going through pain, try, trying to get your, your head in the flat earth world. It's amazing. Okay, so we're going to see if we can answer some questions that are in chat, but chat is moving so fast, it's really, really hard to even catch a question in the middle of this, uh, this going up. So I've asked people to pose a question, and there's so many people watching live right now that it's, you know, oh, here's one, Ray Ray, why does the sun... Why does the sun not get smaller if it doesn't go over the horizon and goes out of perspective? Uh, does anybody have an answer to that question? I, well, think I, I thought Jeffrey Grupp, didn't Jeffrey Grupp have footage of the sun getting smaller? I mean, I can't personally say every day the sun gets smaller. I mean, you're instructed not to look at the sun. But I do know that we do have video footage, particular angles where it does get smaller. So there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, you have different uh, amounts of uh, water vapor, which could reflect the sun, you know, magnify it. Um, but you have to, the only time you're going to see it get really small is when you have an incredibly flat surface. And that may not even be water because water um, has waves. It has tidal bulges in it. And when you have, and I call anything on the, not, the sky is completely smooth because there's nothing there, but the ground has bumps. Those bumps are rocks, waves, people mountains, hills, trees, anything that rises above the actual plane. So when you're looking across a flat surface, just some, some little hills, ho a row of houses or you know, a small hill or whatever, that'll create a false horizon far uh, in front of the actual vanishing point and the sun will appear to set behind it at a much closer range. Um, so there's some great video. Um, I, I have it on, on my question: Why does the sun not set, or how does the sun set um, on my on my on my website? Where I believe it's Africa, where it's showing the sun going into the distance, and that the, the conditions were good. It was a dry day, at, um, low humidity, and an incredibly flat African plain, and the sun gets very small. So there you go. All right, we have a question from Mr. One Princess who says, why not change the term from flat earth to level earth? And I understand where he's coming from. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to add to that or answer that question? I understand that he probably thinks that the terms flat earth are uh, ancient terms and make us not sound very intelligent. Jesse. Um, well, I mean, my, it's just uh, simple. I mean, we've got how many people, six people here, and we go outside of this chat and we say, hey guys, we got an idea, we want to change flat earth to level earth. It's just, it's not going to stick. I mean, that, those kinds of things come up all the time. Uh, somebody in a Google Hangout, I believe Aaron, wanted to change it to the biblical earth. You know, it's so many people have ideas for the overall movement, ways to, I guess in, that, in this case, it's to make it more palatable sounding when you tell it to somebody. Like, Mark has a thing, says, don't say flat earth. You know, the flat earth club say, Enclosed World or Truman Show. I think that's great, but, I, you know, it, how, do you, how do you constitute something that big? Like, we're going to go to all the other groups and say, hey, guys, it's the Level Earth movement now. I don't think it's going to happen. I just don't think it's feasible. And also, there are many people in the Flat Earth community who don't believe in a dome, don't believe in an enclosed world, and don't believe in that sort of thing at all. So it would be leaving them out, and they are 
just as knowledgeable about what's going on here as those who believe in a dome are. These are only things that we can't prove, but that we feel, those who do, that you feel it in your heart, you feel it with research you've done, you feel it, feel it with things you have read in the Bible, etc. So uh, I don't want to leave anybody out of this, because nobody can be left out. Uh, it's all up to the individual to what they would believe. We have uh, somebody, uh, Summer Shine All Day, who says that she has had prophetic dreams about the ceiling falling lately. And that sounds like a strange comment to to be made but uh, Chris in love answers summer shine and says there's a lot of imagery in media lately showing people breaking through glass ceilings and domes so more of that media stuff being uh, maybe the truth being expressed to us in the media Jesse spots what do you have to say just the thing that's freaking me out right now uh, all the friends that have gone silent basically ever since I had my the sky is falling and I mean like like metaphorically with Nibiru and everything, those friends are totally silent. But what they are all doing is they're like taking part in these weird David Bowie rituals with lightning bolts and about, you know, the man falling from the sky. Alan Rickman has imagery that has to do with falling from the sky. I'm just like, I'm just looking around at this imagery, you know, Satan, Jesus saw Satan falling like lightning from the sky. You know, the dome is said to break or something and then the stars fall from the sky that David Bowie imagery that Alan Rickman imagery all these rituals plus with that I mean it's just overwhelming I have no comment other than that but I am overwhelmed by the amount of ritual and in visions that people are having hmm, interesting another question uh, from Jim why excuse me what is Mark's explanation for his appendix scars being indicated on his left when the appendix is on the right Mark Sargent it's all you. <laughs> all right, let's do this real quick. All right, I will not spend a lot of time on this. The reason was you have addressed this already before. I have addressed this, but I'm going to show this on it. screen just so I can get this out there. Okay, one, why would I fig? Why would I even tell anybody if I had an appendix surgery? Why do why, why I just not tell anybody? Say I was sick for three or four days. I yes. think it's. It's only fair that we all take our shirts off. If Mark has to take his shirt off, let's no. all take our shirts off. No, no, off. I am not taking my shirt off. Although, I will say that I'm wearing for this. I know you guys can't see it. That was sent to me by a listener. And I, so I nice. thought that was kind of, kind of cool. But no, yeah, real but that mat's been debunked, Mark. Yes, oh, you're wearing a debunked shirt. Your shirt has been I, debunked. Now you have to take it off. No, what, what 100% am I? debunked. Case I am closed. Not, I am not Stephen Christopher. I am not taking off my shirt. The uh, but but super quick here. The um, what what they did was you could have, and and Patricia knows this. You have a choice when you have your appendix taken out. You can either did a three or four inch slit on your right side, or you can have it um, laparoscopic where they punch three holes in. One about your belly button, but one about four inches down, and one on the left hand side. So I have three holes: belly button down and this side. But real quick, just so what you, everyone knows, I'm not faking this. Here is my. If I want to take a screenshot of that, that is my um, outpatient thing. Screenshot. Here is my all the surgeons that worked on me. You guys can take a shot of that if you want, or I can do it, you know, on another thing. Kind of blurry. Me. Damn it! Can anyone not see that? That all the surgeons at Pro Providence Hospital. Can anyone that probed you? <laughs> exactly. Is that still blurry? It's pretty good. We can see it. All right, and then I will read this, and then here's the drugs they prescribed yep. to me. Yep, can't fake that paperwork. That would be impossible. Yeah. No, there's the drug, <laughs> two antibiotics and a painkiller, none of which I took because it was horrible. And then last but not least, the oh, what is this? this is the pathology report. Pathology report. Mm -hmm. Basically, when they took the appendix out, they had to test it. And they said acute appendicitis and serositis with perforation uh, apparently, when they got out of my body, they threw it into another room and exploded and killed three people. Here's, you know, here's the person that, that did it. I've got all the paperwork for this thing. Yes, I had my appendix out. It was awful. I don't recommend it to, but it was better than the alternative, which was dying. So I believed it until this very moment. Now I'm questioning the whole thing. <laughs> Killing me. I will. <laughs> The thing is, is that being accused, there's no way anybody can explain their way out of these sorts of things because then you just find yourself, you know, just like treading water trying to but, explain but, more and but, more. But, so. okay, but to that point, and this is kind of a broader thing, it's like, look, I, and I said this on other things where I would be a hypocrite if I said, yes, it's great that the conspiracy world is super microscopic on everything that happens out there, but don't be microscopic to me. 
I would be absolutely hypocritical for me to say. So yes, when he noticed that I wasn't pointing at my right side, he was absolutely right. That's because they went in on the left because it was laparoscopic. I didn't even know that procedure existed for appendix surgery. So good, hey, great catch. Uh, you know, it, people catch the stuff, you know, every little picture on the moon and everything that's going on, fantastic. The fact that you caught me not pointing at my right side and actually it was coming into my left, I, I can't get mad at that. Uh, so send me send me emails, you know, if you're suspicious about anything, I'll, I'll send you screenshots. All right. You could even send them a copy of that information probably if they really wanted it. I probably yeah. could. I could take pictures of my phone, with my phone and, and send it. There. All right. They're already like calling those numbers. They probably <laughs> are. <laughs> Operators better be standing by. <laughs> exactly. There were like um, ten people in that room. I didn't realize there were that many people in for the surgery. Well, you Doing were knocked that. out, probably. That's what happens because well, I've had I, mine. Exactly. Out. So. Um, next question is: I'm just going to ask it, just because we're bringing up this this person who mentioned in the chat, you know, asking Mark about the appendix and all of that. Somebody made a video about your appendix and said you pointed to the wrong area, mm -hmm. and. You've explained that, uh, I think, thoroughly to my satisfaction. Thank Does you. anybody else have a question at all here about that? Okay, no. Um, the other thing that's been called into question is on the last secret show, you and I did not this past Monday, but the Monday before, we were casually chatting, and you showed your um, Flat Earth Society membership uh, card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was said that you got that card in, I guess, October of 2014, and the clues came out in February, but then uh, how does it... Actually, yeah, the, you're, you're absolutely right. And, there, and, and again, it's a microscopic thing, but you're right. It absolutely needs clarifying, and I will do it super, super quick. And that is the Flat Earth Society. Yeah, here was the card in question. I don't know if you guys, because it's blurry, you guys can kind of see it. The... Anyway, it's Flatter Society card. So yes, I was looking at. I started. I got. I think I looked at my first video maybe at the end of June of 2014. And uh, remember, there was not a lot of stuff out there. And so yes, I was looking. You know, I figured the only people that knew anything about the flat Earth was going to be a Flat Earth Society, and the only one of any note was these guys, right here, Flat Earth Society. Right there, I don't know if you can see everything, but the, the guy in question, if I zoom in on here, the guy that was running it, and he actually was mentioned in that Guardian article, was Daniel Shenton. So here's what's interesting about this. Because people are saying, oh, he joined this Flatter Society. And I did, because I wanted to know what was going on. But actually, by the time I actually got this stupid thing, and this, this thing's dated uh, August... 28th of 2014. By the time I got you know, my certificate from he, him, because he was in Hong Kong, I already knew everything about these guys, and they, were, they had nothing to, to offer. But what's interesting is, and this goes with an Eric thing, Eric Dubay actually just submarine these guys because when he broke away from the Flat Earth Society, and actually this is called the International Flat Earth Research Society, Eric called his the IFERS, the International Flat Earth Research Society, and he took so many members with him and caused him so much grief that they actually packed it up and just closed down. And we know this because Daniel Shenton, I didn't even know this until Patricia and I were looking it up, Daniel Shenton, his Twitter account is still out there. where, And that's actually also mentioned in the Guardian article where he... Uh, he af shortly after we did our thing in uh, 2014, he closed down the entire site. So all the links to the website, the Flat Earth Society that he was running, they're all dead links, but they're still on his Twitter account. But at the very, I should say, in September of 2015, he posted a single picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger from the original Terminator, uh, that scene where he was coming in back in the police station. It's like, I'll be back. But then we never heard from the guy again. So the so point is... This society that you've got the paper for is not Eric's. Nor no. is it the Flat Earth Society that any of us could Google right now, the one that no, says it's, the it's, ground is rising up. Yeah, it's gone. Uh, Daniel oh, wait, Shenton. The, the Daniel Shen Shenton one, is, is it associated at all with the one that we could all Google right now that's not Eric's, but it's the current existing one that no, says that the no, ground is a, rising up and that proves gravity? Exactly. No, that's a reboot. Uh, Daniel Shenton, I don't think, has anything to do with it. And I, I, you know, this, is, this is Daniel Shenton stuff, and I know this because... They don't give out the stuff. So like, here's a little plastic uh, um, uh, flat Earth. So instead of a globe on a spindle, it's a flat Earth. You guys kind of can see it. You get a little commemorative coin. Now, how did you get? What did you have to do? Did you have to walk over fire or coals or something? What is it that the procedure no, in no, order to get not, the cars you got in October? 
No, it's not like what they do now. Now there's this big questionnaire. It's like, why do you want to join the Flat Earth Society? You know, what are your motivations? What are your intentions? But no, Daniel Shen, no, it was easy. You just put in your name and your address and you give him 20 bucks and he took way too long to do it. But he sent emails saying, I'm sorry, it's been taking so long. And then he sends you the certificates and stuff and that was it. I did not know, though, that it was actually shut down. So when people are saying that, uh, you know, there's this big questionnaire and you have to convince them that you're a big flat earth guy, it's like, n n no, there wasn't. And then I found out that Daniel's thing is completely gone. So, but again, look, you know, look it up yourself on Twitter. Uh, his his Twitter account's still out there. You click on any of the links, they're all dead. So, all right. and I, I blame Eric for that one because Eric, Eric essentially killed off the original Flat Earth Society, the one that, uh, you know, who the first member of uh, was on that, that was um, Thomas Dolby. Very interesting. The 80s and pop star. I feel that's been cleared up. Uh, it's up to the individual to judge that for themselves. It Does anybody doesn't. have any questions at all about that here on the panel? I'm no? I'm still going to be, you know, a drone pilot, KGB, DOD, all the other stuff, but, <laughs> but at least I'm not lying about the Flat Earth or my appendix. Well, yeah, right. it's just... It's just up to each individual's discernment, yeah. you know what I yeah. mean? It's hard. Uh, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't really care. I mean, I, what I try to tell people that, that try to, you know, come at me is like, look, I opened 2015 with making a series of videos saying, you know what, I believe in Flat Earth. Prove me wrong. Did you think I wasn't ready for just about anything coming at me? Uh, I it was, uh, the the opening salvo you know of comments when I finally did turn on comments well you know like everybody it's like flat Earth is dumb you're an idiot you're a moron it's like why are, you know why are you reproducing stuff like that so anyway <laughs> well you haven't reproduced so uh, anyway let, the... enough enough of me on to more pressing questions right David yes how do we know Mark hasn't reproduced uh, yes that's true <laughs> oh that's good that's coming. That's coming. You wait. There's going to be a love child eventually coming out of somewhere. Some cocktail mm -hmm. waitress or something. All right. We've got a question here from... Please uh, not be mine. <laughs> is the Superior Mirage... No, excuse me. If the Superior Mirage was debunked... Oh, this moved. If the Superior Mirage was debunked... Is the Superior Mirage debunked because you can't see it every day? Anyone I think it's because... Different Different atmospheric conditions create um, different uh, abilities to see see far. I love Rob's idea of uh, on a day that you can see it, get on a boat and sail to it and see if it disappears. That's uh, a great solution. Yeah, there is a phenomenon called the superior mirage, but that's where you the the, the image, say for instance, a boat or or buildings or whatever, would be inverted, turned upside down, and uh, I think it is a uh, the other kind of mirage is where it's reflecting in below the object. So these things do exist, but they, there's a you know there's a lot to do with the optics that I mentioned earlier, and and the boats that are f appear to be floating in the sky uh, aren't actually floating in the sky; they're actually upon the sea. And we also have the the, the floating China thing, the city, and that was debunked as being false. I think. Does anybody know? It's not really related, I don't think, but it is kind of related in a way. It's probably a created mirage as opposed to That's, a natural apparently mirage. That a, apparently that was a hologram technology yes. being Interesting. used. Uh, next question, Beth Lam. What do you think of the portals that Enoch says that there are and why do people accept the Nephilim from Enoch but not the flat earth? Um, maybe Rob Skiba could answer that or Jesse Spots or... Repeat the question one more time, please. Uh, the question is about the portals, and the question has moved here. Yeah. Um, David's getting the questions from chat and then typing them here is the, in our inner chat. The, yes. The, the, uh, the portals mentioned in Enoch uh, about yeah. where the sun enter and leave right. and the moons. Yeah. I think uh, Zen Garcia has probably the the best answer on that. He's got a whole. He, in fact, I think he just published a book on it. Uh, the uh, flat Earth as key to decoding the Book of Enoch or something like that. Um, I, I will say this: when I uh, I published uh, this big volume right here behind me, this book has it has it has the Book of Enoch in it, and in the introduction to that book, I wrote that I was going to do a uh, standalone version of just the Book of Enoch with uh, commentary and footnotes, and I started working on it uh, right after I published that book in 2013. And only got as far as chapter 71, and then I got sidetracked on another project, so I dog-eared the page, put the book aside. 
went and did some other stuff, and then I, you know, two years later, find myself into Flat Earth, and I thought, I'm going to go back and reread the Book of Enoch with Flat Earth in mind. And so I went and picked up the book again, opened it up, and I just so happened to, where, where I dog-eared the page is right where the, the section, I think it's chapter 72, is where it starts the, um, the movement of the heavenly, the circuits of the heavenly luminaries or something of that effect. And w what is really interesting about that is if you're reading the Book of Enoch with a spinning heliocentric ball universe concept in mind, Enoch makes no sense at all. And that's why a lot of people wrote it off as like completely crazy, just a stupid fantasy, you know, retarded, whatever. Uh, but if you realize that everybody in the ancient world, they didn't have the spinning heliocentric ball worldview. They had a snow globe worldview with a moving sun and a moving uh, moon over the flat surface. Well, with that mindset, wow, I mean, chapters 72 and following make perfect sense. And uh, basically, what if and I, I don't want to butcher it, so I would say watch the show that I did with Zen Garcia because he explains it a lot better than I'm probably going to. But he basically says they're not so much physical portals that the sun actually goes into someplace. It's more like um, gateways, I guess you could say, uh, uh, in a circuit that it's making. If you see the animation that I did when I used Stellarium to show the the uh, how the four seasons work on the flat Earth map, You'll see, and I did one where I compared January and June side by side. The hour clock uh, uh, ticks away in sync. The hours and minutes and seconds are still in sync. Well, the only way that's possible when the sun's in the tighter circuit and when the sun's in a wider circuit is for the sun to slow down when it's going over the smaller circuit and speed up when it's going over the, the wider circuit. And so what Zen was saying is, you know, as the sun's making its various loops through these things, it's going through like a pathway and he was likening that onto the portals. And I'm, again, I'm probably butchering it, but basically it's the course that the sun takes as it widens and shrinks its circuit uh, as it moves around the earth. M many right. people are asking. Many people are asking, what's the the um, source of energy that makes it speed up and slow down? And the way I equate that is, if um, we have a magnetic center, you know, we live in an electric magnetic universe. Um, if you held a rope in your hand and you're the magnetic north and you swung it over your head, the outer, the far end of the rope is going much faster than the lower end, but it's the same energy um, that you know that that is spinning it. 360 degrees every every time you go. So you know if you had a ball 10 feet out and a ball two feet out, the one that's 10 feet out would be going much faster, but still the same uh, time for 360 degrees. Okay, up next. Uh, up next, uh, oh Jesse, you want to add to that? Just yeah, hopefully real quick. Now that David spoke, I have kind of two things to say. Is um. First of all, there's a researcher, uh, if you Google her name, Cleo Loy, L-O-I, she has done this amazing research setting up these arrays on the ground. I'm not exactly, I can't remember what the technology was, but just shooting up this array of something into the atmosphere, and she's found plasma tubes, plasma tunnels. And similar to trying to read the Book of Enoch on a globe, it doesn't make any sense why there are plasma tunnels like in the ionosphere or whatever. Um, and so what I, what I want to say about the Book of Enoch is um, the, the path of the sun and the portals, the path of the luminaries, it's a long description. It's, lo it's, it's longer than anything that you would write if you were just making literature or if you were just, you know, like, oh, you know, Enoch walked around and he saw the sun. It describes all the different cycles, very long description. I would love to see somebody break down the language in, like Rob just did and, and make different videos trying to come up with their own idea of what it's saying because it, it goes into like the specific day, you know, the one-sixth light, one-seventh light, and then a new cycle begins. You know, to me it basically sounds like it's describing the sun and moon as two plasma lamps where the sun is a pitcher that pours its light into the moon. It's some process, and maybe that's what an eclipse is. I don't know. But I, I would love to see the path of the luminaries um, broken down. I was standing in a parking lot the other day, and I was just looking up at the moon. And, you know, the moon was three-quarters full, but it was, it was dim in the sky. And during sunset, it, it was the same brightness, but because the sun was moving farther away and I could perceive that, 
you know, it just made me really think, like, that thing is self-illuminated. That's like a, just a plasma lamp up there. And that's, that's what brings me closer to the Book of Enoch, is all those descriptions are in there, and I think more people could break them down, and there'd be a huge market for that, too. All right. The next question is about stars. And it's, why don't we see stars in hot air balloon shots? And this is from Tom West. Anybody care to tackle that one? Um, hmm, I don't know. Nobody's raising their hand. Uh, I'm just going to... Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> why we don't see stars in hot oh, air balloon shots? David, you want to touch this? I've been really thinking about it. That's one that I don't know the answer to. But I was having... Um, a thought the other day, and, and I'm just looking to disprove it uh, to start, is the best way to start, is that perhaps, you know, all of the luminaries in the sky, um, you know, in the Flat Earth model, everything is close, you know, the stars, the moon, uh, the planets, uh, the satellites, that we what we call satellites, they're all just lights in the sky moving at different speeds, different sizes. We can't tell how close they are um, and, or how big they are. Um, is it possible that during the daytime, um, that the sun's energy is connected to these luminaries and they stop illuminating and they only illuminate when the sun is a certain distance from them. So even though we're above the atmosphere and no longer see the blue refraction, um, that the stars in the near, near to the sun are not there. Um, a way to prove that would be to send a balloon up at night and see if you can see stars, but it's just a thought. Has anybody sent a balloon up at night? I know many people have talked about doing it, and there's many balloon tests that haven't gone as planned. Does anybody know, Rob? Well, I, I've been having similar questions. Uh, you know, one of the, the excuses that they use for the, the astronauts on the moon and everything and how come they never see stars is because of exposure. The, 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 the camera lenses sets, you know, to, so that the things in the foreground uh, are not blown out or, you know, are not too dark, so, you know, whatever. So when you set the exposure so that you can see the things in the foreground, it, it's, it's too closed down to see what's going on, you know, in the background. So I get that. A lot of the weather balloon footage that we've seen usually have the sun somewhere nearby illuminating the earth br nice and bright down below. So I can see that as being a, a possible reason why you're not, you're not being able to see the stars simply because of the iris issues uh, in the camera. I, I have heard, I haven't vetted this to see if it's true or not, that it's uh, either illegal or really hard to be able to launch a weather balloon at night uh, for uh, legal reasons and safety reasons uh, within the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. So um, that may be part of the issue, but uh, I'm, I'm one of the other experiments I'm working with a, a guy who has um, all kinds of great camera equipment, the same guy that's going to build the gimbal. Uh, we are also working on doing a hot air weather, uh, weather balloon test with a gimbal on it because a lot of the footage you see on the weather balloons, it's spinning all over the place and it's kind of crazy. So we want to be able to keep the camera really stationary. So he's actually rigging up a, a thermal box to keep all the cameras warm and everything that will have an altimeter and GPS and all that stuff in it. But also using GoPros but replacing the fisheye lens with uh, 50 millimeter lenses which will give us pretty close to what the human eye sees. So we're working on stuff like that, and, and I would love, if we're able to do the daytime launch uh, successfully that we hope to, I would like to see if it's even possible to get the permission to uh, do it at nighttime to see what we can see as far as the stars go. So you have to get permission to do that at night then? You have to get permission either way. Uh, I mean, you can't just really, I mean, you can't just go out and do, I mean, I suppose you could, but if you ever get caught, you're probably going to get in trouble for it. Go so, with the rule, go, do it first, beg for forgiveness <laughs> later, right? <laughs> yeah, well, it might be hard to do with a prison sentence or, a, you know, a hefty fine you know, attached to you. Maybe you'll come out of prison with a whole new different view about the Bible, like uh -huh. some people have, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to try to follow whatever the, the laws of the land are to, to you know, do smart. it right. It's smart. I was just um, going to say, if that's okay, on the yes. subject of balloons, um, I haven't talked to this guy in a while, but Brett Hatch is just comes up with amazing things. You know who has an amazing balloon program is NASA, and it's very suspicious that we really don't hear anything about their balloon program, and I would suspect that's because how, that's how they do reentry is they just drop 
those capsules from balloons. I think I think balloons are probably involved in almost everything they do, from you know having maybe a balloon tucked away in some sort of shuttle, or you know I think that's where all the the magic is, is that they have an amazing balloon program, and they don't tell us about it because that's how a lot of their trickery and fakery is done. Now, many of the, of the images that we're seeing that supposedly from satellites are, could easily be from uh, balloons. Hmm. Yeah, and. And r real quick to, to Jesse's point, uh, there's some great videos on YouTube right now about refl ref reflector balloons that, yeah, NASA has been developing since the 1960s. You know, uh, that's you know very high altitude, and they can bounce signals off them on top of it. Why would they do that when they have uh, military-run GPS and well, space? well, you know, back in the 60s, I'm saying they had it, but now, you know, you wonder how well of the legacy systems have been working. I mean, the U2 system, the U2 program is still in use right now, and and there is talk that all the U2 spy planes are, are remote driven because they're so easy to fly that they can put them basically put people. They don't even have to have pilots in them. Jer Zimmerman writes. Any comments from the panel regarding lunar waves? And I know, Mark, you talk about Crow Triple Seven a lot. Does anybody else have any, uh, you know, comments about lunar waves? Uh, I've never seen one myself, but there's a guy in Houston, Texas, where I live, named Robert, who sometimes works with Crow Triple Seven. And during the past, the blood moon, I was supposed to go and watch that with he and his family. We'd never met before, but then it was too cloudy here in Houston, so I never went. Uh, but I know that this guy, Robert, Houston Robert, I think that's what he's referred to when you see him mentioned in uh, Crow 777 videos, uh, is a guy who's looking at that sort of thing. Mark, you had something to say about uh, lunar waves. Yeah, yeah real quick. Um, one was that lunar waves meant something for me in the beginning because it made me question what the moon was. And then once I looked into the temperature issue with the moon, it just reinforced lunar waves. So it's like I'm going, because at that point I'm going, okay, the moon is absolutely not what we think it is. And one more quick uh, note, and you probably already know this, I've said this in different interviews, and that was that's what started the rift between uh, Eric and I, because he said that you uh, that I shouldn't talk about the lunar waves because Crow 777 wasn't a, wasn't a real flat earther. He was just looking for anomalies that were happening up in space. And my argument there is, and I still hold true to this now, I was like, I don't care where the best footage comes from and where the best information comes from. If this person isn't a complete flat earther, but they have something that ties to the flat earth movement, I'm absolutely talking about it because who knows what may happen to this person down the road. I mean, Crow 777, hey, he may be a closet flat earther right now. Hmm. So, Go Going back to what somebody had said earlier, Tom West, who asked, where are the stars in hot air balloon shots? Somebody in uh, the chat said that hot air balloons are only launched during the day. Well, I'm not sure about all of them, but I do know about the ones in Napa Valley, California, and I lived there for quite some time. And in this wine country setting, many people pay to go on these hot air balloons because it's a gorgeous view of the, the wine country at, in any season, really, different times that the, uh, the grapes are on the vine. And I have been to many hot air balloon launches with a radio station I used to work for there in Napa, and they start filling them with air in the dark of night and they go up when it's somewhat dark and you could potentially see stars if you could see stars with the ones in Napa. So that answers one of the questions in chat. Um, Jim Sidori says, does anyone on the panel have any predictions regarding aliens in 2016? Now if we're going into the realm of predictions, we will now just say predictions are and aliens, this is just theoretical. So anybody want to tackle that theoretical question about aliens? Anybody? Hmm, oh, we have a lot of hands going up. We're going to go with Thorovsky, but first, just randomly. Well, my take, even before getting into Flat Earth, was that there are no aliens in the sense of what we are typically told are aliens, that we're dealing with interdimensional, not extraterrestrial beings. We're dealing with the demonic sources, um, you know, Nephilim, fallen angels, and that sort of thing. Uh, it, that point is driven home even more if we are in a still flat enclosed world. If we are in a still flat enclosed world snow globe, there are no aliens. <laughs> there are no. There are no other worlds out there. Uh, you know, we are center stage in the biblical model. We are it, and the stars. And I did. A, I, I finally did a really in-depth study on the stars uh, and what they represent in the scriptures. And unquestionably, they're angels. 
the stars are angels in the biblical text, and the book of Enoch tells you point blank the stars are a class of angels known as the heavenly luminaries. So, you know, if there is any sort of alien disclosure or anything like that, every radar I blip in my head's going to go off and say, this is demonic, this is fallen angel activity, or this is a big psyop of the military, and, you know, it's a government, blah, 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 and that sort of thing. Uh, so, I find it interesting that this whole topic is even coming up of the flat earth after, what, 500 years. That, that maybe all of this is happening to prepare us not to be deceived for anything that might be on the horizon in the near future. Jesse Spots on aliens. What are your thoughts? I th well, I mean, I, I know a lot of people are anticipating some event like um, a UFO landing on the White House lawn or I guess in the Vatican, and I don't um, discount any of that, but I think that the globe was, was the main alien deception and that the freedom of mobility is what these quote unquote aliens wanted to, to, to offer us. So again, like Rob said, in the flat earth, they can't really offer us anything. Maybe they can take us to Antarctica. And I think that the main alien deception to look for is the things that are already out there. People like uh, Corey Good and David Wilcock with the Blue Avians, Pepsi, huge corporation endorsing a real alien invasion with the Black Knight decoded. Uh, it instructed people to go outside at the next full moon, look up at the sky with your arms open, and just to talk about unity with the coming aliens. Has that happened yet? No. So there'll probably be a lot more teasing, probably trying to get people's imaginations going, because somebody somewhere knows that the Earth is flat. Makes a lot of sense to me. We're going to go to Matrix Decode. Ben, anything about the potential alien invasion or fake alien invasion programming or, or such like that? Yeah, we, well, we definitely be, are being set up to see some kind of alien event or the yeah, introduction of aliens into our culture somehow. I mean, uh, with, this, uh, with the universe as, as its mainstream science has it, they, 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 they predict the... the uh, the reality of aliens, but I mean, I, I agree with Rob uh, that I think it's more of an interdimensional thing, a spiritual thing uh, going on. Um, I think uh, we, you know something like the ISS, the International Space Station, and, and all the, the amount of bloopers and mistakes that are coming out from them. I think the, uh, maybe at some point the ISS will be attacked by aliens and destroyed. Uh, Very interesting. In 2016. Uh, one of the predictions when, Mark, uh, you and I did our, our New Year's Eve show, we were talking about the ISS potentially uh, ceasing existing through some, we don't didn't know, but it was one of our predictions, and it may tie into something you just said, Ben. Anything you need to add to that, uh, Mark? Uh, one, I was actually dying during that New Year's Eve show, just so oh, you yeah, know, I had, right. a, I had appendicitis. <laughs> so any, any predictions I... So. Well, yeah, no, but any predictions were probably under duress. And yeah, the ISS, and again, that Canadian newspaper ran the story. Uh, don't discount what's happened in the last 30 days where NASA has come on. One of their guys said, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to be shutting down the International Space Station and setting up a moon base in place of it, and that we're shutting down the Orion program. So, yeah, that what a great opening. We're going to shut down the ISS, but before we do, let's see what happens, shall we? You know, And then all of a sudden... Again, there's going to be some disclosure somewhere, and it's going to be fake. It's going to be staged, but because, again, we're you know we're, even though our numbers are growing and this thing's still resonating, a lot of people are going to buy it, hook, line, and sinker, uh, and and it's going to be it's going to be a great show. Well, I can imagine everyone's outside screaming and pointing, and meanwhile, there's one flat earther per state saying, "No, no, it's fake." <laughs> Then our lone voice will be squelched as everyone runs in panic and tramples us. That's my prediction. Not a very pleasant one. Um, this is a question from uh, somebody whose initials are DT for all panel guests and asks, have any of us seen the Lazeria map collection? And this is something connected to the Hollow Earth. I don't know anything about it, but I do know these are ancient maps. So anyone know anything? I don't see anyone raising their hand. Lazeria map collection. Mark, do you know anything about if, it? If, if this is the one, uh, if it's tied to the hollow earth, the one where it's actually showing uh, the four rivers that are pouring out of the hollow earth, and that's you know where the, the, the main water is coming from, I've seen some of it, but I don't know. It's, it's kind of minor compared to the uh, other things. I, but you know, you, you know, because I've talked about it before, I'm still a big believer that the hollow earth theory 
does not conflict with this at all because uh, who knows what's underneath this. Remember, we've only drilled down officially eight miles, and yet science talks about you know, describing the Earth all the way to its core 4,000 miles in. So, I do see that there are videos. Lazaria map collection is the Earth hollow. So if somebody's interested in that, we're unable to really speak to that because we just don't know. But if you'd like to pursue that further, please check out a video on that, a couple of videos on it at least. Let me look and see if there's any other questions that have come in from chat. I know there have been, and David Weiss is taking them from chat and then typing them into the window here. So, um, oh, Ray Gun Rogue asks me, has Flat Earth gotten you closer to receiving God's love for you? That's a, such a hard and deep question. I've always felt loved by God, but I wasn't able really to believe that there was God. That doesn't make any sense. It's not that I was an atheist before Flat Earth, but I was brought up saying bedtime prayers and being told that God loves you, and I always kept that in my heart. And then as I got older and would, was just had that taught right out of me by school when it came to science and, and all of that, you can't really put those two things together. You can't believe in God and believe in evolution. It just didn't make sense. So I went with what everybody else did and didn't think about it much. It just thought that people that believed in God or Jesus were, were nutcases and crazy religious freaks. And then Flat Earth came, and there's a ch bigger chance for me becoming a quote-unquote crazy religious freak now than ever going back to be an atheist. So, yes, I feel loved by God, and I sometimes even feel protected. What does that mean exactly? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm looking at a lot of things right now. So that's the answer to my question. Anybody else want to want to talk to that and be put on the spot about do you feel God's love for you? Uh, I guess Rob Skiba, I can imagine, <laughs> would want to answer that. Well, I actually uh, ended up having to build a whole page on my website, testingtheglobe.com, just on testimonies. And those the testimonies are on there. I mean, it's a pretty long page was early in this whole thing. I mean, within the first couple months, so you're talking, you know, May or June, somewhere maybe maybe as late as August when I put it up, I'm not sure. Um, I get emails constantly from people uh, on this issue. And, you know, for me, even though I haven't committed to it, I'm looking at it and going, well, this, this makes a lot more sense, biblically speaking, uh, that he's literally right over us and he's looking down on us and we are the center stage, we're the main attraction, we're all there is, then when we had this view that God was somewhere outside of the universe, we always had to make it uh, in another dimension or something where, um, you know, if the universe was the way we are told by modern science and Star Trek and Star Wars and all that stuff, then he's, where is he, you know? And how does he split his time caring for everything, you know, that all the other beings and everything out in the universe? You know, I, I always struggled with that, um, to be honest with you, uh, and just accepted, well, he's he's bigger than all of that. He's bigger than the universe, and somehow he's able to be everywhere at the same time and, you know, uh, and all that. But when you take the literal interpretation that he sits on the circle of the earth and, you know, he walks in the circuit of heaven and there's this thing called the firmament over us, then he's really close <laughs> uh, and and that's very comforting for a lot of people. I've that's one of the comments I hear a lot is, "Wow, they just all of a sudden feel very important." See, the thing about the spinning heliocentric model and people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Richard Dawkins, and Carl Sagan before those guys, all of those guys make it a point of telling us that we are totally insignificant. We are the pale blue dot in a, in a um, you know nondescript area of the universe in a uh, galaxy that's nothing in nothing special in an arm of that galaxy that's nothing special that you know all you ever hear from that camp is you're nothing you're nobody you're insignificant the insignificant pale blue dot well the very significant terrarium is the exact 180 opposite uh, mentality and uh, I think many people who who start looking into that feel that God is very close to them and uh, that's sobering in a lot of ways, um, but it's comforting in a lot of ways as well. It sounds odd, but I kind of feel... It's really hard for me to admit these things because I was so not the person that would even use the word God that I feel, well, here we go, ready? That God told me about Flat Earth, or at least told me or pushed me or suggested in my heart to look at some videos. All right, I've outed myself now. Jesse, do you want to uh, speak to that? Well, at first, just generally speaking, because 
that w as much as we wish that these articles are going to bring a lot of people to flat earth you still have to humble yourself to even really approach it and really understand what's going on here I mean it seems so absurd you have to humble yourself in some way you know that, that a lie could be that big or that you're going to go that close to your greatest fears or desires and if people don't know my story by now I had this whole sky is falling incident where I hadn't paid attention to the 2012 prophecies I thought all everything was just bunk these people were delusional and I had my own Nibiru thing where it was the only explanation for the people acting strange around me um, everything fell out of whack and I humbled myself cashed in all my chips and became a total social outcast was looking at the sky every morning just to just to prove that something was happening that I could show people on camera that something this planet was coming I don't know and what happened at that point this movement started and I just looked over and I was like what are those people talking about and it it's not like it dawned on me that that was the explanation for everything I was seeing I just integrated myself into it like yeah I guess the earth, the earth could be flat and here I am now you know it's 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 this uh, it's this sense of immediacy in God's uh, in, in that God is having in my life that I I don't I don't have those kinds of questions anymore I don't doubt and God is just an immediate presence in my life I humbled myself and he's rewarded me and I don't I don't even know how to take it in I won't know how to take it in I don't allow myself to think I just go you know and on a day-to-day -day figuring things out I've made it this far all right anybody else want to speak to God in their life uh, their belief system uh, regarding this before we move on to another question? All right, I take that as a no. Yeah, sure, I'll have a go. Oh, good. Uh, the, the reason that I'm not going to Ben, if anybody doesn't understand who's watching, is because we all have our pictures lined up where you can't see them, but Ben is using an icon to cut down, to make his bandwidth work, and so I don't know when he wants to talk. He can't raise his hand. So, Ben, please, <laughs> please go ahead. I don't mean to leave you out. No, no thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've always believed in the creator, a creator. I mean, you just have to look around and see the, the beauty and the complexity of this, of our reality. I mean, uh, and trying to figure it out. That's what we're all trying to do. It's about seeking the truth. And on your journey of truth seeking, you come to discover many, many things. And you, you start to look at, you know, particularly with flat Earth. I mean, you know, I looked at evolution, uh, you know, a few years ago, and you know, I think Kent Hovind does a great job at dispelling that myth. And you know the People like Richard Dawkins, who an evolutionary biologist, you know, he can't explain where life began, how it originated, and he has a lot of different excuses. Uh, and when asked about it, he, he, he doesn't have an answer. And, and it's, it's a, you know, so I mean, the, the relationship with the Creator is something that's you know, personal to every one of us. And uh, for me, you know, I don't know what the Creator is called. Uh, I don't know who, who or what it is, but I. I I see it there, you know. I see, I feel, I feel the presence of, of the Creator in my life, and I think flat Earth is a. Uh, it points to. It's fascinating how it points to all the ancient texts and like the Bible, and so on. And um, you know, it's really and that's just a fascinating subject to study. And it's a, uh, you know, I think if you're out there seeking the truth, you're you're partly connected to that spiritual, um, something spiritual about it, you know. And, uh, it's it's a it's about a personal journey, and I think that you know the the whole atheist thing is really based upon this whole globe Earth um, pseudo science. You know, it's unproven. It's all just the theoretical, and uh, it's really disconnected a lot of people from the Creator. And I, and I can see like flat Earth is you know getting people to question this science, which upholds all of atheism. So uh, and you know people are. You know, starting to realize that how they've been deceived and, and um, reconnecting with the Creator. So. Th thank you, Ben. We have a question here from Artro Blanco. Anyone know how much power the ISS is supposed to use to keep all their systems going? It would use way more than their panels can collect. Mark Sargent, I know you've had somebody on your show pertaining to that. Yeah. Yeah, and for anyone that's asking any questions about the ISS, I direct them straight to uh, my YouTube channel, or you can just look up uh, Industrial Engineer Valves and Seals talks about the ISS, uh, or just go to Mark K. Sargent, the website, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the YouTube channel, 
and look up that interview. Uh, basically, there's not a lot of, there's only like five really, really big companies in the world that talk, that, that deal with industrial valves and seals, and this guy worked for one of them, and he went on and did the entire interview, basically really attacked the ISS and said, look, nothing there makes sense from an engineering standpoint. Nothing. Everything from their doors to their heating and ventilation system to the atmospheric pressure, uh, you know, how the oxygen gets fed in, how it recirculates. It's, it's, he goes, none of it makes sense. So look into that, uh, that interview first. And then when you're done, um, uh, you know, then, then come back with more questions because that should answer all of it for you. All right, we've got another question from Zetetic Rob. What's going on at the South Pole? Anybody have an opinion about that? Jesse's thoughts. This was one of the first things that I thought to research because the idea of more land just got my imagination going. So I did a little bit of research. This was like, gosh, this was like, it feels like last year. I can't even remember. But the conclusion I came to was that there's basically this peninsula, and that's West Antarctica, and that's what I think Qantas interacts with, and any pole expedition that people take, it's basically on one side or the other of this little peninsula. Now, it's big compared to the U.S. You're going to be trekking for a long time, and you finally get to the South Pole. And what do I think that is? I think it's just a ceremonial place that they've set up. I think there's a camp there. I think they have an airport, a basketball court. But I don't think it's an actual geographic place that we should really care about. It's redundant because I think that Antarctica is a ring around us. So I think they've basically set up a couple of flags on a ceremonial pole on a peninsula on an ice ring. And we give it a lot of meaning. I don't think that we should discredit the pole treks because they're very laborious and it means a lot to these people, means a lot to the communities when these people come back. But I just, I don't think it's an actual geographic pole, so to speak. All right, David Weiss. Jesse, I, everybody says, including you, um, and I even say it myself sometimes, when people are talking about Antarctica not being a continent at the bottom of the ball, but rather a ring around the world, people look at that as like a fence. And and I think we should all, if we're all meaning the same thing, when I say Antarctica is a ring around us, Antarctica, the border of Antarctica makes a ring around us and then it spreads in every direction outwards from the center. So, you know, I, I, new people to this that don't have their heads wrapped around it, when they hear that it's a ring around it, they're thinking of an actual ring with an inner edge and an outer edge. So it, are you seeing it the same way? I mean, when you say a ring, you mean it the, the edge is the ring and it continues on and we don't right. know how far? I mean, right. that's that, when, I, when I first got my head around Flat Earth, it's like, that's, that's just the little mental trickery. That's the illusion. And now you get that far, the person's educated on that premise. Yeah, is it speculation? Do we have evidence? In my case, I have a whole slideshow of land somewhere in New Schwabia. What is New Schwabia? It's beyond that ring, right? Right. So I just think that we should all try to rephrase that. Um, Antarctica begins with, uh, you know, its edge makes its edge makes a ring around our oceans and continues outwards from there. I just want to mention the reason why I like the term ice ring, and I certainly didn't coin this phrase, is whenever you want to highlight the socio-political danger that people are in, say. Um, I don't know, like climate change. If you want to highlight that climate change might be dangerous on a flat earth, the ice ring is the perfect phrase to use. But you're right, if people are getting hung up, you're going to want to change your phrasing. We have a question from Chad Riley from chat who says, did you guys bring up, which we have not, the newly discovered tunnels in Antarctica tall as the Eiffel Tower? I believe reading that casually, and I don't, didn't really take much on board, but Mark Sargent, you know a little about it. Well, no, I saw the article, and in fact, I, that, that article is, was sent to me just, what, like four or five hours ago? Yeah. So, yeah, nobody's really gotten... I mean, yeah, it's an interesting story that there's, you know, massive tunnels that could hold the Eiffel Tower, you know, in terms of height that are underneath, you know, they're traversing through the ice, but it's it's too new to really... Nobody's even made a video on it yet, I don't think. Yeah, maybe other people knew about it before, but I've only found out about it recently and do yeah. not know. 
Uh, Dominic Wilbur asks, why don't we challenge that jet propulsion doesn't work in space more? Anybody want to answer to that? Um, I see Rob Skeever kind of you're shaking your head yes. The thing well, about yeah. the jet propulsion not working in space is we've been told what space is, but maybe, I mean, we've been lied to about everything, so how can we start refuting that those engines don't work in space? It's more like those engines don't work in the space that we've been told. Rob, can you clarify? Well, yeah, I have the I have the same question. Uh, I mean, what what are they pushing against? What how how are how do they have propulsion in a vacuum? And I've seen uh, there's a guy out there who was testing this. He had like a little Hot Wheels kind of car or something with like uh, I don't know if it was firecrackers or whatever it was on it, and he and he had a uh, or uh, he had some kind of propulsion thing on it, and he had like a vacuum cleaner right next to it. And kind of sucking in whatever the propulsion was, and and it was, it was showing that the thing can't move, basically, or or was very limited in its movement, in the vacuum. So yeah, I have a lot of questions about that. I mean, wh how in the world does any of that work out there in a vacuum? In chat, I'm looking now, and I believe that Jaren is there, and Orphan Red is there, and there's a bunch of people who have joined us. The Morgyle is there, so hello to all. Martin Leitke is there. Chris in Love is there. Robin Poe is there. Teresa Gordon is there. I could continue going on, but uh, it would be crazy. It would be just reading a whole bunch of different names. But I just want to say hello to all, and thank you for joining, and I want to apologize again to Jaren and the Morgal because we stepped on the toes of Globebusters, but had to in order to get this panel together at this time to do this. So uh, anything else that we want to bring up? Anybody want to come up with anything, that, kind of a final word, something that they'd like to discuss here today? Or, you know, we haven't really talked about maps, and that was the big issue with Tiger Dan, saying if there's no map, there's no case. Uh, what about maps? Is there still flat earth, a movement, if you want to call it a movement, this group that we all have loosely associated different beliefs across the plane, different perceptions of what the flat earth actually is when it comes to a dome or no dome? Uh, what about accurate maps? Do we need accurate maps in order to prove our case? Who would like to take that on first? If no one answers, I'll be like the teacher who assigns it to you. <laughs> uh, I think, I don't know if it's Rob raising his hand. Uh, uh, Mark, 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 Mark's, ra Sergeant. Mark's raising his hands like you're, crazy. You're, 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 wearing, hands. you're wearing your glasses. Come on, you can't see me? The... Yeah. Um, uh, no, when it comes to the maps, look, we, we all know that the uh, the official map of where we are, we, we've known since the beginning there are flaws in it. We don't know exactly what it is because no one's actually, that that's the big secret. We don't know what it was because that's what they've been hiding for all this time. I still think the UN flag is indicative of it because they developed it in 1946 and I think they jumped the gun. Uh, I think the basic layout may be right, but the scale's probably wrong because... If you had an exact map of what this was, would you actually show the general public? Even if you were trying to hit, hide it in plain sight, eh, maybe parts of it, like like the angles of, of the flights in the southern hemisphere, how they straighten out, you know, those shallow dog legs and and perfectly straight lines. But as far as the distances go, uh, you know, that's that's up for debate, definitely. But do I think we need an absolute perfect map to keep this thing going? No, not not at all, because. Everybody that's in this movement is at different stages. You know, they're all trying to handle different aspects because it's so big. Everybody's trying to get their own, have their own take, their own interpretation of it. So having Dan come out and say, no, no, if there's no map, that's a bunch of crap. No, not, not at all. I'm not giving up, you know, this, this thing uh, and, and, this, and the maps I've been using, not, not for, no, not, not, never going to happen. And other people are working on their maps as well. Anybody else want to address the maps question? Do we need a map in hand to be able to point to, to show people who believe we live on a globe that this indeed is where you live? Or can we continue using the AE projection, which isn't really a real map? Rob Skiba. Well, I would say the ballers don't have an accurate map either. Uh, I mean, people have seen the the uh, West Wing episode where they're addressing the Mercator map and the fact that, I mean, if you look at the, the standard map that most of us grew up with in our public schools that we all saw up on the wall, Greenland's about the same size as Africa. But in reality, it's way, 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 way smaller. So, 
you know, I mean, while people might knock the flat earth movement for not having an accurate map, I would s turn it right back around and say the ballers don't have an accurate map either. Yeah, that and, yeah, you're he's absolutely right. That that's probably that's that's a great great point and should not be understated and that is the Mercator map is dead wrong. Absolutely dead wrong. The Gall Peters map, that's the projection if you're going to use a flat map, you know, you know, on a classroom wall and they can't get the Gall Peters map into schools. 500 years we've been using the Mercator map and that West Wing episode was perfect because it's like look it's it's wrong not even it's not even well, just a little bit wrong it's really really wrong and I've included that slide in videos all over the place you know where I've just put you know that layer on top that was done I think the Sky show did it and it's it's brilliant so yeah sorry to inter interrupt Rob uh, Jesse Spots yeah, I mean, all anybody has to do is is go to Wikipedia, where all the different map projections ever made are have are listed. It's it's a fun little hobby. You can make a YouTube video about it. Even there are maps you've never seen before, and in every case, the author or the the artist uh, of the map tells you which specific relationship they're highlighting. For some people, it's you know east to west orientation. For some people, it's just an adjustment. But there have been maps published all throughout history, and it's always a specific relationship they're highlighting. Mr. Thrive and Survive, in, in that video that I mentioned earlier, highlighted um, his cartography classes and how this, as a muffle map, the relationship that's being highlighted is from the North Pole outwards. The accuracy as you get further away gets less and less reliable. And so of course that's the litmus test that Tiger Dan and others are using against us. As far away as you can get, even that little dangly thing on the, I don't know what we call it, the ice ring or the ice beginning of the ring, um, how are you going to create a proof based on something that, that that map isn't even supposed to highlight that relationship? That's not what the map was designed for. You'd have to find a map that's highlighting that specific relationship. Just like any proof, there's always a premise that people need to be educated on. And in this case, people were hoping to brainwash us on a premise that that map wasn't even designed for. All right, David Weiss, uh, there's some Flat Earth stuff that you want to plug, so plug away. Well, I, I just wanted to wrap up by saying, you know, we all have different styles of uh, videos and different messages we're getting out there, and you need that because there's different types of people. You know, some people like my short videos. I add some humor to them. I add some humorous music. Other people hate it. You know what? If you hate it, move on. Go, you know, go to watch a different show, watch, watch something, but it, it brings everybody in. I'm really loving um, Mark, I mean, uh, Rob's, uh, um, you know, message with the with the spiritual part in it, but before, I would have tuned that right out. But everybody is going on their own journey um, and, and getting their own thing. Also, um, lots of us spend a lot of time doing all of this. Um, people have been asking if they can make donations, and uh, you know, I don't actively look for donations, and I'm not asking anyone for donations. If anybody wants to donate to anybody that's their business, go ahead and do it. But there's lots of people that... Um, take this enjoyment um, and, and appreciate it, but they're just not um, willing to give up any money or maybe they don't have any extra money. That's fine. There's one way that you can help and it's for another flat earther that's not involved in this show and it's Jaronism. He does some amazing work. He donates um, all of his time. I can't imagine how much he puts in and he has an amazing way that you can donate where it won't cost you a penny. If you just go to his website, click uh, support and click Amazon. We all buy stuff on Amazon. Just click Amazon on his site, buy your regular stuff, and he gets a commission. It doesn't cost you any more. You're helping the flat earth. He can make more videos. We can wake up the controllers that are, are uh, uh, suppressing us and uh, live our lives free and have our children have a future. So any way you can help, that's what I'm saying. You know, Help, support, even just a nice comment is, uh, is a way to support us. Yeah, a nice comment, a thumbs up, um, sharing the videos that you like, avoiding the videos that you don't like by any of us and any of the many other people in Flat Earth. Hey, that's the way to go. It's the, not a cult. We're not going to join hands and sing Kumbaya. We're loosely connected, all of us. Uh, but we all are interested in the Flat Earth, and we all are interested in exploring it and attempting to debunk it if we can. So and, as long as people are polite with us, of course. And, mm -hmm. and one more thing. I believe Jaron is going to be on your show, Rob, in 20 minutes. Is that true? 
Well, he's supposed to be, and if he's listening, hopefully he can <laughs> confirm that with me. Uh, I, I sent him a message on Facebook saying, dude, are we still on tonight or not? Because uh, we're supposed to go on in 20 minutes uh, on Truth Frequency. Right. So if I don't hear from him, uh, then I'm going to do a pre-recorded show or, or a rerun. Um, but if I do hear from him, then, yeah, we'll be on in 20 minutes. <laughs> and I believe on Sunday I'm going to be on Globusters, I think, around 2 or so with Jaron. So anyway... Thanks to all in the panel, Rob Skiba, Mark Sargent, Jesse Spots, David Weiss, and Ben Matrix Decode. I appreciate it. I will put links to all of the gentlemen's channels in the bottom of this video, but I think people already know who you are. And I appreciate all who were in the chat tonight. We had uh, about 614 now anyway. There were more earlier. But I just want to say thank you, and I appreciate everyone being here, and I hope to do this again with some of the same, perhaps, and maybe some additional uh, people that I wasn't able to get a hold of and people I didn't even dream of even thinking about getting in the next time we do this. Maybe it could even be monthly. So thanks to all, and uh, I always say keep it flat. Hey, uh, David, do you have something else to add? Rob, Rob, don't hang up. I need to talk to you after the show. Okay. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> thanks, okay. guys. I had a lot of fun. All right. Bye, thanks, everyone. Guys. Thank you for being here. Bye, guys.